Welcome to Fat Man. I'm Batman. I'm Kevin Smith. And I'm Mark Bernard. Hey! Hey! Holy shit, we are live once again, as always, from the Scum and Villainy Cantina right here on Hollywood Boulevard in Hollywood, California. Put your hands together so the folks at home know you are not fictional. Um, I, uh, I'm running a few minutes late because I was home watching The Runaways, part five. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good fucking show, man. It's not bad. They finally, spoilers, they finally used a f uh, some of their powers like all together at once. There's a shot at the beginning of every episode that shows them all together and like kind of like the group shot, like the Avengers turnaround shot mm. of that show. And I was like, when's that going to happen? And it happened in episode five. It was pretty <laughs> awesome, man. Are you current? I am almost current. I didn't watch today's, but I'm, uh, I'm almost caught up. Uh, charming as fuck, no? It really is. It really is. And my, my kid, my, uh, my 13-year-old son, who will not watch anything that I tell him to watch because he doesn't think I'm cool, right? Uh, which is fair because I'm not. But he was like, uh, hey, buddy, want to watch Stranger Things? I hear it's cool. Like, no, it's bullshit. And then you put it on. It's like, oh, dad, this is awesome. Want to watch The Runaways? I don't think so. Sounds like bullshit. And now it's, hey, dad, when's the next Runaways? I want to watch more Runaways. It's a thing that you could share. Yeah. He's like, this is the one thing I'm not ashamed about you for, <laughs> Dad. <laughs> you have this much taste. Uh, I Speaking of shame, I fucking I spent the morning uh, bawling in tears uh, because I watched all of uh, uh, Crisis on Earth X, the CW crossover event. Uh, so I, I did it all in one sit down. And oh my God, it was... It was, fuck, it looked expensive. Uh, <laughs> all I can think about is like having done a few of those shows, the scheduling nightmare of getting everybody together on screen. And they did lots of scenes where they were like, look at all these fucking heroes, you fucks. Like just really showing off the whole cast and working together and crossing over and stuff. But incredibly uh, emotional. Like yeah. especially considering like, you know, it was, they're fighting you know, planet Nazi. And which is like, this makes for a great comic book show. And, and it, you know, wow, what a great re reason to interrupt uh, Barry and Iris's wedding and mm. stuff. What a great reason to bring a lot of characters together and then bust them out. But they took the fucking story in legit directions that changed the shape of all the shows going forward. Yeah. And more than that, they were fighting Nazis. Yeah. And for real fucking Nazis. Not like kid Nazis, not like science fiction Nazis. Yeah, not like, like on our world, he was Nazi. called Hilter. No, yeah. Like it was flat out. They it's, said Hitler a few yeah. times. They's like, what's that per pink triangle for? It's like, oh, well, let me tell you what this is about. Like it was, we're not fucking holding anything back. Right. Nazis. Um, it was beautiful. And then spoilers, if you haven't seen it yet, <laughs> cover yours because we were talking about some shit. They killed off Professor Stein. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I told you to fucking cover your ears. <laughs> <laughs> um, they did. Like I, I thought. I mean, you know, it's it's kind. That's a big, bold move yeah. at that point. He's been with the show since, like I think going back to Arrow, but definitely Flash. Yeah, I think that he he was leaving the show. He's going back to Broadway because Victor Garber is a for real fucking thespian. I was like, this yeah. is fun, you guys, but. Broadway's calling. I th and also that show too, particularly, he was on Legends. Uh, that's a show that's got like 96 main characters. So I imagine the shooting is grueling on a show like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was sad to see him go. And I, like, I, I was shocked at how fucking moved I was by the death scene. Um, but the, my only note of like, you know, like I understand him and Jax had a, the connection as Firestorm. And so he gets to die on, on the wave rider, you know, uh, in the operating room and with, with his better half. And they had this beautiful fucking monologue about, like, you're like my son. You've said I was like your dad. I'm like, like you know, and they, they had this relationship. So then in the denouement of the story, you know, they're, they're at his funeral and they're burying him and stuff. And, you know, his, he, he gets up there and he's like, his wife asked me, his family asked me to speak and stuff. And so he talks about, you know, the connection that they had. But then he like breaks down and then like goes over to the mom and the daughter and starts like talking about like, I should have done more. And I was sitting there watching it going like, don't make it about you. <laughs> like, 
like this ain't the end of Schindler's List. Like fucking, you couldn't have done any more than you fucking did. And it was weird. It took away from the family more. That's the only thing I would have done different. Is like I know his wife wasn't a main character on the show, but he had a fucking wife, and they were like uh, the heroes were all there, and like we fucking lost Professor Stein. And at the end, they were like, oh, his wife's here too. <laughs> so it, it was it was the only note that was kind of weird, but all of it was just fucking beautiful. Uh, they found a way to even soften uh, Oliver Queen, who on TV is just like hard as a rock. Um, gave him a, a bit of an emotional beat with Felicity, and they let them got married in the last like fucking ten seconds of the whole event. Well, it's easy to make him softer when you actually give like Fuhrer Oliver Queen on this <laughs> stage at the same time. It's it's like, true. Oh, that's a good one. He's still the same fucking hard ass, but he's not a Nazi. Um, what else did I really like in it? Uh, I thought it was a really cool idea that like you know it's the evil Supergirl needed a heart, and they're like, let's just take it from fucking that Supergirl. And they did say, though, that like there are 52, you know, they go by the DC, the new 52. There's 52 different Earths and stuff. This with Earth, was Earth X, one they left out of the books because they're like, it's just so evil. But they said at one point, like, there's a Supergirl on 52 Earths, which means that, like, in their continuity, Supergirl is on a different Earth already than Flash and Arrow. So right. does that mean they can introduce a Supergirl on... Earth Prime, or you know, on in theoretically, yeah. Would they? I don't know why, but they could. They could do whatever they want. Sooner they or later, show. I think the like the next crossover event would probably be Crisis on Infinite Earth, so they can collapse mm. at least those two universes into one universe. Right. Um, but I was shocked at how moving the fucking Nazi one was. Not because they were <laughs> Nazis, but because like. A, they were beating Nazis, and that was always fun to see them punch Nazis. And they could kill them, too. Like, they were, heroes were killing. At one point, Oliver Queen, like, you know, didn't have his fucking bow and arrow. So he's like, fuck it. And he was like, Pfft, spraying bullets. And I'm like, you would never go back after that, dude. Like, <laughs> like look at the maximum carnage instead of fucking one. Two, which and I agree, like you're real good at it, but pick up a fucking gun, like. <laughs> so uh, it was it was a, a wonderful event. I, I enjoyed the whole fucking thing, eating, sitting down, eating it in one full swoop, and it was it just looked like one big movie, and they played it like that as well. Yeah, I appreciated that more than a, than the last crossover, which felt like distinct episodes of those shows that kind of had some webbing that tied them together. Yes, give me one big four hour story. I agree. And Supergirl yeah. last season, it was just the tail end of her show. They were like, hey, man, come to this other Earth. Right. Like in the coda. But they had a, each one carried a full episode. There was a really nice moment where, you know, they do that on those shows all the time. Nice, nice callbacks where uh, she, they called the other Supergirl, like uh, Oliver and her were a couple on Earth Nazi, on Earth X. And so uh, she was a general. Mm -hmm. So that allowed, and, you know, they said it the whole fucking series and of the three episodes leading up to the moment. And I fancy myself a writer, and I fancy myself clever sometimes, where, you know, I could see shit coming. Like, oh, I, you know, I didn't see The Sixth Sense coming. I'll give you that. But who fucking did, you know? So, like, this, I should have saw coming, but when they kept calling her General, and General, and they always kind of borrow from the Superman mythos, they are setting themselves up perfectly for the moment where Melissa goes to fight, you know, uh, herself. Supergirl goes to fight Supergirl from Earth-X, and she's outside the ship, and she goes, General, would you care to step outside? Like, a direct <laughs> lift. And I was, I was alone at 4.30 in the morning watching this in my office, Blaze going, oh! And my wife came running down, like, what happened? I was like, fucking Supergirl! Just, she goes, I don't give a fuck, and turned around and walked away. <laughs> so it was really, really, really wonderful. Um, what else you been up to? Uh, I went up to Hearst Castle over the weekend for my sort of belated birthday, la da have oh, you ever been to Hearst Castle? I have. A long time ago, I got dragged there. It's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I like imagining it as like, what if Bruce Wayne just was rich and didn't actually fight crime? This is what he would have done. True. And I found myself having to explain shit about like Citizen Kane to my wife, but not in the presence of the kids. It's like, yeah, no, the movie's about a guy who had a sled, sled's named Rosebud. Rosebud, FYI, is named after Marion Davies's clitoris, which we've been hearing about the entire fucking time. They tell you that on the tour? No, I'm trying not to tell my wife that in front of the children. <laughs> Why, did you read it in the literature or something like I that? I know this. 
because so then it must have been hard not to share it. Like you're the only one that's going to share it because they're all Marion Davies. Like, Look, it's William Randolph Hearst and Marion Davies, his longtime paramour. And I'm like, oh, honey, that. Never mind. Yeah, it's awesome. I'll tell it. you later. But it's awesome. Did you tell? Did you tell her later on yeah. when you guys were alone? Yeah. Was it like foreplay? <laughs> You guys have been married a while, so even the mention of like, hey man, Rosebud. <laughs> also, I'm not filthy rich, so no. <laughs> um, it's beautiful, that estate. Yeah. Uh, I read somewhere recently that, I don't know, where was it? Yeah, somewhere I fucking read, somewhere online. You know, Chris Hardwick, mm -hmm. the nerdist, uh, his lovely wife is part of the Hearst family. Yeah, the great-granddaughter or granddaughter of William? I, th I believe she's Patty Hearst's daughter. So yeah, great great granddaughter of William Randolph Hearst, aka the you know the real life citizen Kane, Charles Foster Kane. So I think that like he can go up there and like take a shower if he wants. <laughs> like isn't that fucked up? You would be walking around the tour and you'd be like, hey, how enjoy your burrito? And he's just going to, to raid the fucking fridge because like he lives there now. It's kind of cool. This is all mine. You can all leave. Yeah. That's the power of a podcast. Where, where's our mansion? <laughs> we'll never have. <laughs> this is our mansion right here, man. The Scum and Villainy Cantina. I love coming here. <laughs> home away from home. Um, all right, man. So we right before we went, uh, JC was saying, hey, some people want to get some shit signed. I said, oh, just have them throw it up on a bar. Some people bring like pops or whatever. But I believe somebody threw up their passport. <laughs> Which I will happily fucking sign, man. I guess I can't. Whose is it? It's yours? You have two? So it's a dead passport. So, but this is not legit anymore. Oh, it is legit. So don't personalize it. As well? What's your name? What's your name? C-H-R-I-S-T-A. I mean, listen, a brother can always use another passport, man. Chris, wait, after the A, what happens? Don't fucking look at me like you ought to know how to spell this. <laughs> That's a lot of fucking letters, man. Wait, so is it Krista... Krista Ferrari. What's Ferrari? Your whole name is Krista Ferrari? Oh, so your first name's Krista. Yeah. Generally, I don't sign everybody's fucking all their names. I pick one and fucking, like, it's so weird. She's um, Krista is good, spy, right? though. Krista. Yeah. Fucking, I can't get into this. Krista spelling. Alexandria Ferrari. She's going to fucking steal the Pink Panther diamond after this. I wrote, Krista, travel, with an exclamation point. Does that work, or should I write more? <laughs> It. <laughs> You're welcome for. You had a seizure. You were the girl that had the seizure at the improv. Oh my God! So we had a show at the improv at Hollywood Babylon. Well, I got. Let me explain to everybody else. We're not the only ones here. Um, <laughs> We, we had a show at the Improv a long time. This is going back, right? Yeah. And in the middle of the show, uh, Krista here had a seizure. And we thought we were really funny, but that wasn't it at all. And, <laughs> and they, thank you. And then they, they, they got you out of there. You were there as well. Man, you were a hero. We were the ones going, what do we do? Like, we froze up on stage. <laughs> um, but we, then they, they came and took her away. So while, while you were going through the seizure, you were like, I still have to listen to this fucking podcast. <laughs> A fucking insult to injury. <laughs> so wait, you, feel like, you felt like you died? Your heart stopped at that club? I'm totally changing the marketing. <laughs> Heart stoppingly good show. <laughs> Do 
Wow, man. All right, so holy shit. So is this writing your, travel was so shit. Is this your passport back to the land of the living? Uh, oh, 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 uh, uh, pass back to the living. Hmm. Nah, just to say thank you, so I can uh, keep going on and using my passport in general, huh? Rock and Explore fucking the world. Hey, man. Um, uh, number one, great to see you again. Here's your passport. Thank Don't you. forget that. You'll need that. Um, and number two, hey, fucking, what was it like on the other side? You feel like you went to the other side? You really want to know? Well, <laughs> I did until you fucking said it like that. All right. All right, hold on, hold on. Here we go, man. So, so I got I, up. I, my mom took, went to the other side. She told me what she thought it was like. Let me see if it's anything like what you saw. Okay, so I stood up and I went towards the door, and then all of a sudden I it turned black, and the force pressure was going up, and then, then stars were coming down, like the Star Wars stars, like long stars. No, that's Star Trek. Okay, and then um, I was being lifted on my body. Boom, I went out and then lifted up and 360. No hunger, no anything, just like unconditional love. Life passed before my eyes like in a, uh, a wheel of fortune, dirt, 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 dirt type thing. Landed on the last thing. The guy was like, ha, ah, you thought you did something. Yeah, you're dead. No. And then like seven people lined up. They're like, hey, how are you? Oh my gosh, I was so happy, so loved. It was amazing. And then... This guy comes up and he's like, da 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 da, oh, and he goes, it's not your time. And then it was like, okay, they open their hands, and then they put them together, put their hands together, and then they closed them and went like that. I'm so fucking like, scared later. right now, and man. Like, <laughs> this is fucking this terrifying. Wait, 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 slow down. This is too much information. So I went down this hole, exactly. Like, I can't even, I don't think I'm allowed to tell everything for some reason. Like, and then I woke wait, up so like, oh my gosh. So overall, good or bad no. experience? It was. Depressing. I was depressed for four months after, and I was also happy that I knew how to keep my body uh, from failing like the new uh, actor. Well, not new, but from True True Blood, not to take up too much time. He died from going off alcohol, which we were talking about previously over here, and that's yes, what happened to me. I just Lafayette. quit. Like, I thought, okay, you can just quit. You can't. You got to really, like, you gotta can't taper it down. Out. Can't even do that. Like, it's really dangerous. So... Yeah, that was great. So if I had benzos, I would have. It was it was great wherever it so, was. When so I came back, I was really angry because I felt my body again. I like, you know, I pulled out my hands. I looked at my butt. I was like, this is a shell that I have to live with and through and use. So you were know. mad that you came back. You would have rather. I want to go home. I called it. I want to stay wherever that was. You want to merge with the and infinite. I'm not allowed to s go back. For some reason, I don't know how to. It, it, I'm not allowed to go back. Like I'm not even afraid to die. Like let me die. Like even if I stood at the cliff, someone would be like, boom, and knock me over the other way, like a bird, because I can't. Like maybe I can get injured. But so flatliners is bullshit, is what you're saying. Yeah. Well, the, uh, you look. If you look it up online, they have five come back. Like come back like five times in a row, and they're like, oh God, God, God. I gotta tell you, that gave me some fucking hope. Did I you don't know it? if it's God, but I know that it was something that was uh, definitely connected to the earth. I saw a bunch of grass and butterflies and flowers and a big, huge lake behind and sun and trees and just everything was, it was great. It was what great. kind of grass? What kind? Green, green, <laughs> green, green grass. No dead grass, long green grass, but not too long to where there are snakes in it or anything. Just no, nothing yowling or evil trying to pull you into a dark place? No, I saw, no, just. It I sounds like Amsterdam. Dogs or cats. What's that? It sounds like Amsterdam. Amsterdam. No, 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 no. See, this place is more like the mountains, up very far in the mountains. Even up on Highway 2, you could probably find it on the West Fork, maybe. So it's like Elysium Fields or Rivendell. Uh, it's better. It's better. There's no, there is no comparison to this place. Fantasy Fucking Island? Hey, I'll find one. I don't even want to talk about superheroes <laughs> no more, man. Holy no, I'll shit. just write a book if this actually is resonating with you. I'll just write a book on it. Do that. Write a book on it. All right. Fucking um, hey, Give it up for the dead nice girl. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Well done. Krista Ferraro. Fuck, man. Um, everything's going to seem trivial by know, comparison at this point. Well, anyway, on with the news. <laughs> what happened in Hollywood, Mark? <laughs> Well, I, I watched, I finished The Punisher. Oh, did you? Yeah. That'll cheer us up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a good time. Really, it is. It's like a party. It's like a birthday party for an eight-year-old child. It was insanely well made. It really was. And by the time you get to the end of it, yes. 
It is still three episodes too long, as all of these things seem to be. Okay. But it's actually kind of beautiful. Like, it's, it's very much about loss. It's very much about pain. It's very much about Frank Castle being a crucible for himself and for everybody else. And, and having to burn away everything that's left of him to find out what's, what remains after that. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of hopeful by the time you get to the end. Really? Yeah. And you get to meet Jigsaw by the time you get to the end. Really? Yeah. Which oh. is kind of fucking badass. And sorry, do you, do you see an origin or? Uh, yeah, you've been watching the origin the entire time. Really? Really. Do you want me to spoil it for you? It's that good looking guy? It's the good looking guy. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Billy Russo. Wow, I liked him. He was really good. Yeah, and watching his face get shredded is kind of lovely. Yeah, it really is. Fucking A. No, I mean, the, the, it, the show earns every step that it takes. And by the time you get to the end, it, it, especially on the heels of some of the other Marvel stuff we've seen, this is a show that knows what it is and knows what it needs to deliver and knows what you want out of a main character. It's, yeah, it, just, it gets there. What, uh, Dolph Lundgren and Lou Gossett Jr. can rest happily knowing that the mantle has been carried <laughs> forward. What, um, what, d- where's the character left? Like, is there season two forthcoming? And yeah, but you I think can keep going. You could, but I think every season is going to be like the one last job for Frank Castle because he seems kind of content at the end of this show. But yeah, next season I'm sure will be. We killed Micro's family. Does Micro make it to the end? Yeah. Does Micro gain weight? Nope. My favorite thing about him in the comics is he was a fat guy. I could identify with Micro. Fat guy and then they cast a fucking thin guy. I'm like, I'm lost. I got nobody. <laughs> um, right on. All right, so yeah. I will finish The Punisher. You should. It's worth it. Yeah. I, I mean, look, I was digging it, but, like, you know, took an emotional toll. Mm. Uh, it was the kind of show that, like, you fucking stop watching, call your mother, and be like, I'm so fucking sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go hug your wife and protect your kid, shit like that. Uh, but I'll, I'll check that out the rest of it. Yeah. Um, there was a trailer that dropped over the last couple of days. Batman Ninja? Yes. Did yes. you see this fucking thing? Fuck yeah, I did. The show is called Fat Man on Batman, so whenever something Batman related <laughs> pops up, my ear is to the ground. And uh, I saw that trailer early the day that it, they released it. Warner Brothers Japan put it up with no subtitles or anything. There's just this gorgeous anime-looking take on Batman where Batman's fighting the Joker on the rooftop in Gotham and somebody explodes a bomb or something and suddenly he's in feudal Japan Mm -hmm. and his entire world is represented in feudal Japan. So you have Harley Quinn from back then and Batman is dressed like a, I thought a samurai, but it's called Batman Ninja or Ninja Batman. Uh, Batman colon Ninja. Mm. But like he's got samurai gear Yeah, he's got fucking armor. Like ninjas didn't wear armor. It looks fantastic and the Joker's got an army and it's represented on his armor and then at the very end of the piece, they indicate a giant fucking robot Joker, which I was like, holy, f- where'd this fucking come from? And apparently, they, they're, everyone involved is a legendary name in the field of anime. And this is one of the first times that Warner Brothers is like, hey, man, go nuts. Do what you yeah. want. So they're releasing that here with uh, an American voiceover track mm. or a, like a, a Chiron edition, so you, subtitled, so you could just read the whole thing. But it looks astounding not even just like oh my god look at the attention to detail and how cool it is seeing batman dressed like a samurai but it like in terms of just animation alone like it looks like uh akira good yeah like, insanely good and also just like that's an original take like i've never seen that before what was the name there was there was a dvd that got released i want to say like 10 years ago was it like batman gotham knights was yes that it? yes yeah. where it was like 10 different little sort of one little shot shorts stories. that were taking place between batman begins and the dark knight yeah but like half of those, I feel, were also Japanese in origin. Not all of them. Some were like computer animated. Very true. But it reminded me a lot of that. Just let let these guys fucking roll with it. Like, uh, what are they gonna do? Beautiful. It could be amazing. And it's also like I'm sure it'll sell in its country of origin. That's where they were promoting it. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's gonna fucking move here like that. You give us a representation of Batman that looks that fucking badass. I don't care if you're not an anime fan or not. It's something that people watch. Um, it looks fa- looks fantastic. Uh, and, uh, you know, it comes at at the right time for some people who are like, Justice League wasn't my fucking Batman. Well, here you go. (laughs) (laughs) Nobody could argue with this Batman. He's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, Christopher Nolan seems to have figured out why Warner Brothers DC is floundering. Really? Yeah. Somebody asked him and he spoke on the record. Uh, he's like, because I'm not doing it. Uh, (laughs) 
<laughs> P- pretty much. Um, according to the, the a conversation at the British Academy of Film and Television Arts in London, okay. the problem is DC not giving filmmakers the time they need to be creative. That's a privilege and a luxury that filmmakers aren't afforded anymore. I think it was the last time that anybody was able to say to a studio, I might do another one, but it will be four years, is what Nolan said to Warner Brothers when he went from Oh, his Batman point Begins. is like, they want one of these a year, and so you know the production line has sped up, and whereas I had a bunch of time to come right. up with Batman movies, luxury, and I can go do other shit between them, they're they're pumping these fuckers out like a puppy farm, and so there some of them are <laughs> some of them are going to be broken along the way. Some of them are going to have hip dysplasia by the time they're three. Yes. Hey, I had a fucking lab, man. I know what I'm talking about. But yeah, like he had seven years between Batman Begins and The Dark Knight Rises for those movies, mm. and in the five years since Dark Knight Rises, DC's released five movies, and so his point is, if you give them more time, they'll make better movies. Um, sure, I, absolutely, but I think. The idea is they're like, look, right now, here, superhero movies earn. Even the ones that we make that nobody seems to care that much about or like that much have made tremendous amounts of money. Suicide Squad, uh, Batman v Superman, Justice League notwithstanding or something like that. So, of course, it behooves them as a studio. They're like, how do you think we keep the fucking lights on? You know, back when it was Westerns, we did nothing but Westerns. So now we're in this business as well, and we're going to do this for a while. I, you know, I... I th- you're never going to get them to slow down, even yeah. with what happened. You know, I, I, and not like what happened was a train wreck, but even with Justice League, you'd imagine that'd be a moment to pump the brakes and, hey, let's decide going forward if we even need a, a, a connected universe or if we just Warner Brothers this shit and just let people make movies that stand alone and blah, blah, blah. And everybody has a different take on these characters. But um, that'll never happen again, not as long as you can make money off these things. And remember, this was a company that, like, what, a couple of years ago was like, here's our ambitious slate of 183 <laughs> movies. And here are all the dates, including Cyborg 3, you know. It'll be a long time <laughs> before we see Cyborg 1, I think. So I, I, I don't see them slowing down. I think, if anything, they move to the, they pivot to, we're going to make, we're going to have them be disconnected and, mm-hmm. and we're going to have people make their own versions of these characters, but we still got to keep to one a year. I would do it too. Like, think about it. I mean, I guess he's right. Nobody was like, we want a Batman a year from you, but it's a sustainable character with a wealth of creators. Why, why can't you commit to a Batman a year? Just give him more development time. Back it up by fucking two years if you think that's the key. That's the secret to the whole thing. I don't know if that's necessarily the case, to be honest with you. Like, Having more time, I'm yeah. I mean, I think like the Iron Man. How about this? Just don't do that. <laughs> don't make those kinds of movies. Yeah, like make movies that people are like that was fun and shit like that. Yeah, like there was there was time between Iron Man one and Iron Man two, and post Iron Man two, they knew they were going hard. Like Iron Man two comes and then it's Thor, Cap, the first Avenger. Then it's fucking Avengers, and then you're rolling. But they gave themselves a little bit of time to build the Marvel did to build the train tracks. To understand that, okay, we build these tracks right, we can just get the train rolling, and as long as we keep putting tracks in front of the train, we're okay. DC has never, to date, built those tracks. And so it feels as if... Well, but, but they have built tracks, just not for a connected universe. Like, one could argue they built the tracks in the 70s with Superman. They invented the superhero, modern-day superhero movie. And reinvented it in the late 80s, early 90s with Tim Burton and Batman and shit. So they, it's not like they're like, we're new to the hero business. What they're new to is the idea of like, oh, all this shit has to make sense now? Fuck, you know? <laughs> like, because he had some movies where Batman was like, you killed my parents. <laughs> and you're like, he would never use a gun. They're like, oh, he wouldn't? Fuck, all right. <laughs> How about this? The next movie starts with him fucking, uh, his, his mortal enemy gets thrown in the sewer by his parents as a baby. Is that better? <laughs> people are like, I don't think so. And then they changed it up. Like, hey, now he's, you know, fucking uh, over the top with Jim Carrey. And people are like, we kind of like it. And then they're like, nipples and Robin. People are like, fuck you. So <laughs> they've been all over the map and shit like that. Like, it's, they're, they're completely familiar with superhero movies and, and they've redefined it a couple times. But it's just the idea of connecting them seems to be the, the hurdle for them. Right. And like it's problem. weird. It's weird watching somebody who knows what to do. And again, we always personify the studio as one person. But the people that were there during the Chris Nolan era, 
aren't necessarily there. Like Sue Kroll in marketing, I think she's still there. But like Jeff Robinoff, he was the the Chris Nolan guy. He ain't there anymore. Now it's like Kevin Tajahar. So he can't be like, they've lost their way. Like the people who are working on these movies now, they weren't working on the comic book movies that helped define the studio in that era. So, I, you know, I, I, to me, it's weird watching them fumble with extended universe. It's, you know, it's like just take the cuffs off yourself. Just go back to what you know best, which is we're going to make a trilogy of movies with this filmmaker and if this works. Like, seems like what they're doing with Wonder Woman right now. Like, the idea that, like, they'll have Patty Jenkins keep coming back as long as she wants to and definitely make at least three of those mm. before they think of rebooting or something like that. So maybe that's their lot. Like, instead of trying to be something they clearly have a problem being, the Marvel Universe, just do what you did best, man. Do what all got us here. Like, you honestly don't get to the Marvel Universe without Warner Brothers' success with the DC movies across three fucking decades. You know, it's like they, they built the fucking trench. One could argue they built the track. Um, Kevin Feige built a way better fucking train and opened up new routes and made the train comfortable and, like, gave you food on the train and, like... <laughs> Then turned the train into a plane so you weren't even fucking on the ground anymore and then took you to space. Like, you know, he, he just improved upon something that was there. Yeah, but I mean, I think that Marvel, Marvel to DC is handcrafted versus automation in that, in that Marvel has figured out. Like, DC, you're right. They were first to the door. Superman, Superman 2, and then the other Supermans we just want to talk about. And then the, the <laughs> Burton movies, then the Nolan movies. They were yes. the work of singular filmmakers yes. doing a thing that took time. And also, by the way, filmmakers who weren't even necessarily like fans, like right. you, you know, Tim Burton. Uh, historically, Tim Burton was like, I didn't fucking read Batman comics, and Chris Nolan historically was like, Batman. I didn't grow up on Batman comics, but something about like the idea of a character who was like blah, you know, appealed to them and shit. Yeah, and it's 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 hand tooled. It's like a fucking Ferrari. <laughs> They're only making a hundred of those a year. She's Marvel. like, fuck your pun. I saw the infinite. <laughs> <laughs> and it was beautiful. Laugh at me now from beyond the grave. <laughs> Marvel is making Hyundais. And people love Hyundais. And they can make 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 Hyundais. Yes. Each one of same quality. Each let's, one coming let's upgrade year after that. year. I, Marvel makes iPhones. Let's be honest. Okay. And everybody loves a fucking iPhone and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and other people make other phones, droids, although they're not allowed here in Scum and Villainy, as we heard from <laughs> JC, which is JC's own fucking joke. Sometimes you got to give props where props are due. Give it up for JC's Scum and Villainy <laughs> joke about <laughs> droids. It's pretty amazing. Um, but yeah, let's say they're, they're, they make iPhones. Mm -hmm. What is Warner Brothers slash DC? Fucking Android? No, they're Galaxy 7, clearly, because that shit blows up in your fucking hand left and right. <laughs> I mean, but it, it should be like the fucking red phone on Commissioner Gordon's desk. Yes. It should be this like artisanal, old school, beautiful piece of design and engineering that you can't mass produce, that you can't do any faster than you can do it. Right. And that's the problem. They're in a world where everybody's getting what they want immediately and they want to keep fucking making the perfect phone. And you don't have time for that. It's time is, is their enemy at this point. True. But yet, I mean, I'm not defending or anything, but yet it seems like... Maybe Marvel's not making the perfect film, but like as close as possible to that type of film. Like yeah. in, in terms of, you know, uh, they, maybe they don't do like what Chris Nolan did. So much so that like, I remember the summer that Iron Man came out, mm -hmm. like it came out in May and then like Dark Knight came out in July or something like that. So for the first few months, it was like, holy shit, man, like fucking Iron Man could be really cool. And then, oh God, the Joker, you know, and suddenly he owned the rest of the fucking summer. Um, it just feels like they, they know how to make something. They move the playing field rather than compete in that world and say, we're going to try to out Chris Nolan, Chris Nolan. They were like, we'll just redefine what a comic book movie is and yes. hence what excellence in a comic book movie could be. Like suddenly for somebody like me, the bar goes to a place of, now you just got to show me fucking 20 people in costume in one place and I'll fucking sign away my child's life to you. That's how devoted I could be. Yeah, I mean, Marvel, what they did was they decided to stop making movies, and they made giant TV shows. And each one of these movies is an episode of the massive Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the Sweeps Week episodes are Avengers movies, where we got to get all the fucking money, we got all the fucking ratings, that's when we're going to put all our money on the table. But then, you know, Thor 2, eh, 
you know, it's a mid-season episode of Alias. You know, we're like, ah, whatever. I guess it was okay. It's fine. What an odd pull, man. <laughs> you got Garber on the brain. Victor I got Garber. Garber on the brain. But like those movies, and I love them to death, they don't do for me what real movies do for me, which is have actual emotional stakes at the end of each movie. Right. It's the ongoing story they're telling. It's the developing drama of these characters. But half the time, like we walked out of Thor, and we're like, you know, there's kind of nothing here. It's a ton of fun, and I love being here, and I love the movie. It's gossamer thin. He fucking lost his eye. Spoilers. I yeah. mean, you know. He lost his eye and he lost his dad. Yeah. And then like two minutes later, it's joke time. And I love it. It doesn't land at all. It doesn't live at all right. in, in Thor's heart in the way that you'd think losing your fucking dad would. But those movies aren't about that. They those weren't close. <laughs> uh, but, you're right, though. It's true. It's, I, I hold those movies to a different standard. Yeah, it's television on the grandest scale possible. And Kevin Feige is the showrunner. And DC is great at giving filmmakers movies to make. And so, like, The Dark Knight is a perfect beginning to end, enclosed, encapsulated story mm -hmm. that has emotional heft and it lands at the end and you feel all the time. Right. He's not about making some 10 episode version of Batman, he's the one who makes three good movies. And maybe that's just what DC's great at. And I would love for them to do that because they're not great at this. So, let's find the thing that they are great at and do that. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, where did we start? What was the origin point for that? Uh, Christopher Nolan, knowing what is wrong with DC movies. Right. Time. And then we're like, he don't know, but me and Mark <laughs> sure do. The story of this podcast. <laughs> um, what do we got next? Uh, hey, Margot Robbie, speaking of a non-connected universe, yes. is developing her own Harley Quinn movie. Really? Yeah, by her lonesome, separate from Gotham City Sirens. Separate from whatever Gotham, I mean, whatever Joker, Harley movie that they're talking about making. Right. She just wants to make a straight up Harley Quinn movie. I mean, that's, and, and look, she's the key to making it right now. She is Harley Quinn. So yeah. why, if I'm her, yeah, why not develop it? Why not? Why? You're not, you're the star. They kind of have to do whatever you want. So why not be like, I want to develop one. While you guys are doing it, I'm going to do it over here and whichever one works best. Or, hey, man, you go first, I'll go second, whatever the fuck. But. I want to, if I'm, I'm happy to play this character, but now I would also like to take a, a bit more agency with the character, come up with the story. Yeah. I think that's smart. And like you said, it's about their disconnected universe where there's now three or four different Harley Quinn movies in development. Will they make all of them? I don't know. Will they make two of them? Probably. You know, like that character is so fucking popular that I absolutely see there being a Gotham City Sirens movie and then a Harley Quinn movie or a Harley Quinn Batman movie. Why not fucking do that thing? They just released one animated, right? Harley yeah. Quinn, Batman, or something like that. Batman, Harley Quinn. Yeah, um, it can totally sustain. I mean, look, I, I honestly, you do a good enough Batman project, movie, you can make a Batman a year and people will pay for it over and over and over again. And he's got, like, such a massive rogues gallery that just don't put nine of them in a movie. Just give him one fucking villain per, per flick. You'd get to 25 movies before anyone got fucking bored. <sighs> Uh, but, you know, if they want to continue, like, I, if I was running things, that would be my spine. Mm -hmm. And then everything else would be like, and we'll do like three others per year, three other fucking hero movies. Because they've got all the characters. Um, and that's what it is right now in this, in, in town, it's the IP game. It's whoever has the most IP is going to win, which leads back to, uh, today, it, news broke again. Yeah. That the Fox Disney Disney and Fox are in serious negotiations and we and have been all through Thanksgiving and we may in final negotiations and we may be hearing a story as soon as next week or the end of this week that uh, that they've bought 60 billion dollars worth of IP from Fox, which, yes, of course, everybody in this room is interested in. The, uh, that's the X-Men, that's mm -hmm. the Fantastic Four. That means you could slam them into the Marvel Universe and have the Marvel Universe be united uh, finally. But it doesn't stop there. That's Planet of the Apes. Mm -hmm. That's the X-Files. That's everything on FX. It's the Simpsons. It's the fucking Simpsons. It's like Disney would own so much of everything that you love. The only place to go for it is the mouse, man, where you're just like, I'm fucking fiending for it. <laughs> He's like, pay up, bitch. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I, do you think the government lets that happen? Is that a monopoly? They're not buying all of 20th Century Fox or 21st Century Fox, they call it now. The, they, they'd just be buying a big chunk of it. Fox, of course, would keep the TV network and right. 
and Hannity and, and, and uh, all the sports pro, uh, networks that they have. But they'd just be out of m m creating content, movies and TV. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's awesome for us as consumers. It's less awesome for us as creators. Why? Because that's one less buyer. That's one less studio. Like, if 20th Century Fox goes away as a movie studio, as a TV studio, You're right. then that is only six more places, six more giant fucking companies, one of which just became a thousand times bigger than everybody else. Or, uh, 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 Disney. Disney. Yeah. Like, I think that's, that, that creates a somewhat unhealthy business environment. When one person can dictate the terms and act independent of competition, really, because they own everything. Yeah, but at the same time, like, it's not like, you know, there were fucking... Five families, and now we're down to four. New networks and studios have erupted over the last fucking five to ten years alone. Netflix, Amazon, Hulu are massive players in the space. Maybe, you know, 20th Century Fox is just like, look, it's not for us anymore. There are others out there. We don't want to compete. We don't want to create new shit. We're making a lot of money over here. You know, maybe it was just time for them to fold. It could be. It could be. It's just, it's, it's, it's a somewhat dangerous precedent to set. And yes, Netflix has all the money in the world until they don't, because who the fuck knows how many people are watching Netflix. Hulu has got five or six years left of this amazing spending they're doing, and I say this as a dude who collects Hulu checks. This level of spending for this few viewers is unprecedented. Like, they're talking about spending $25 million an episode for this fucking Amazon Game of Thrones, um, Lord of the Rings show. Yeah. That's ridiculous. And they spent $250 million just to get the rights to make that show. How long can you keep spending that kind of money and have no idea who the fuck is watching it and not being able to monetize it through, through advertising and not really being able to charge people more than 10 bucks a month for Prime and that somehow makes this a sound investment? Somebody will run out of money sooner rather than later and then lots of people run out of money and then people who create content will have nobody to sell it to and then we'll have to be like, hey, so the Avengers and the X-Men fought one time while we're staring at a desert of entertainment choices because everybody's broke. And that movie will be called When Podcasts <laughs> Ruled the World. <laughs> um, wow, man. That's, I, I didn't see the slippery slope that this puts us on. I just I was like everyone else. <laughs> fucking X-Men Avengers! X-Men Avengers! That infinity gauntlet resets the fucking Marvel Universe and introduces Reed fucking Richards! You know. But you're right. Uh, that's one less place to go to. But Fox was never interested in my bullshit anyway. So, <laughs> so fuck them. Yeah, really. Um, wow. But I'm. I. It's. I guess. I guess you're right. That puts a lot of balls in their court. But they're paying for it. It's not like they're I get stealing it. I mean, I've said. I've re read some reports online where people are like this is a fucking crazy deal. Like sixty billion for this. It's not worth it. But. For, for Marvel and for Disney, like, number one, they'll get back the theatrical rights for the entire Star Wars universe, mm -hmm. like the first three movies, the ones everybody fucking loves from back in the day. They'll get that back into the Disney fold. That's over at Fox right now. Plus, bringing those characters home, that re-energizes Marvel Universe, which we know is coming to its close, the phase, whatever phase we're in, the first mm -hmm. era, 10 years of Marvel movies. And it's not like, you know, we're going to check out when they go, but... Looks like we're going to lose some major heroes along the way. Why not have back pocket, not just like, you know, ladies and gentlemen, man thing, but instead, <laughs> like, fucking ladies and gentlemen, for the first time ever, fucking doing it right the fan, since The Incredibles, the fantastic fucking four, you know? <laughs> the first family of comics. And so they could re-energize, make new loot off of that, you mm -hmm. know, and, and turn it into more toys and stuff. I could like this is a company though. You got to remember when they bought Marvel, they bought it for what? Four? Six? Six billion. Six billion. When they bought Star Wars, it was four. Four, four billion. And Pixar was four billion. Okay, so, wow, yeah, that sixty billion is a fucking lot. But Fox is just like, take it or leave it. We'll sell it to Comcast if you guys don't want it. Yep. And they say in all the reports that Fox would much rather deal with Disney. They'd rather see all the shit go to Disney. Would they still keep? The name, like, would Fox, the network, still be called Fox, or would they call it Diz? Like, does everything, <laughs> what happens at that point? Do they keep the branding, or do they slowly phase that out? I don't know, man. I think there's, there's a world in which you don't want the marketplace confusion, so they rebrand and rename themselves something else, but... Dicks. Dicks. <laughs> the combination of Disney and Fox. 
watch these dicks. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, some dick pics. Um, all right, so we're one step closer to one yeah. uh, Omni company. We are. Uh, speaking of what, what is it in uh, in Wally? Uh, buy oh, and buy and large. Buy and large. <laughs> Sooner or later, we'll be under. We'll all be in flying chairs, drinking cupcakes out of straws. Fingers crossed. It's the world I've been praying for. <laughs> Is that what the Great Beyond looked like? Please tell me yes. <laughs> Sailing on deck chairs like in Wally, very large. Nobody judging anybody else and shit. Drinking cupcakes out of cups with straws. If I can't eat, don't want it. Utter um, satisfaction. Never felt before unconditional love. Something that you feel for one second, but it just goes on forever, it seems. And you don't ever have to question it or where it's coming from or who's around you. You're just like, yay! <laughs> I Fuck fucking me. can't wait to die based yeah. on that it's description. Me neither. I really can't either. I need, they say, you need to finish something. It's not my time. Whatever the hell it is. Whoever you are, stand up. Let me tell you so I can go. I'm God. done. No. I'm See, I, I want the you can eat everything and not get fat. Not You're not hungry. That's true. No need for food. Yeah. I like it. Um, all right. Where all right. are we going next? Uh, speaking of worlds colliding, Quentin Tarantino wants to make a Star Trek movie. Yes. <laughs> and I imagined when I heard that, that I would go to the internet and the whole internet would be like, of course, this is what we want. But there was a, a degree of people going like, I don't want him anywhere <laughs> near Star Trek. And I'm like, why? He, was, he watched it growing up. Like, he's a fan. Fucking Kill Bill has like, you know, revenge is a dish best served cold. Old Klingon proverb at the yeah. beginning of the movie. Like he may not be a dyed in the wool Trekkie, but like this is a guy who's a natural storyteller, one of the greatest American filmmakers ever lived. And he's showing a remote interest in Star Trek. Like, I'm glad that JJ was like, get this man a writer's room. You know? <laughs> That's so smart. Like, it's not even like he's going, I want to write the script. So, you know, be like, say triple again, motherfucker, I dare you. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you're not, it's not going to be like put through his filter. Like, he's got a bunch of ideas, sat down with JJ, and JJ was like, I'm going to pull together a writer's room. We're going to try to turn this into a script. And hopefully then he goes forward and, and directs. And why not, man? Like, Quentin years ago wanted to direct Casino Royale. Yeah. He wanted to make a James Bond movie. I think he even got so far as to met with the Broccoli family or whatever. But at the end of the day, they said no. And you're like, why? Like, that brand with his brand? Give it a shot. What's the worst that could happen? They wound up doing well with their reinvention of Bond and stuff. But it seemed like there was a missed opportunity there. JJ's smart enough to not let this be a missed opportunity. He's like, Quentin Tarantino remotely interested in a Star Trek anything? Oh my God, I'm gonna fucking follow this through and hope it turns into something. And I hope it turns into something, man. Yeah. It feels like a, feels like the right, like he's directed things that he hasn't written before. Yeah, episodes I mean, of TV. episodes of ER and uh, CSI of all fucking things. So he can, you know, if you watch his own films, clearly he's a born filmmaker. He knows what the fuck he's doing. But he has proven that he can work with a script that's not his script, just Quentin Tarantino. And I think on some level he might welcome the idea of like, let me just see if I could do a Star Trek movie. I know he's all about experience. Like, you know, I, I had a phone call with him once. This is going to sound name droppy, but I was in Vancouver and I was shooting Catch and Release. And I had like a day where they're like, come on in at six in the morning. You'll be in the first scene up. And then shit got moved. And so I didn't like work until five at night. So you're just kind of sitting around, and I was in the trailer, and I just watched both Kill Bills back to back. And so I was in a rarefied breathing space where I was like, I could literally call this dude up and fucking tell him how much I enjoyed the movie again. And I was in such a fan space, the head space, that I did, and I called and left a message. I was like, hey, man, like, I just finished watching Kill Bill 1 and 2. Like, it is beautiful, but Kill Bill Volume 2 to me is fantastic. Like, I've seen you do things like Kill Bill volume one but volume two is like you telling a family story it's about a broken fucking family it's really kind of beautiful and and like the superman monologue is the the, the shit so like thanks man that was cool and he called me back like an hour later and we just sat there chit-chatting on the phone and i said to him i was like we were talking about the movies i was like you're gonna make another one ever and he goes that's the thing i wasn't going to but now i know how to make that movie like i know how to make a karate movie i know how to make a movie of martial arts and it would feel weird not to put that to the test or use those skills just when I acquired them to suddenly put them aside and never make another one. So I hope he does Star Trek. 
because it allowed it would allow him to put his skills to work on something else that isn't his, something mainstream. Let him play with somebody else's toys, and that might whet his appetite to do it further. Because he always tells this fucking story about I've only making so many movies, and then I'm stopping. And maybe this is a way for him to be like, look, I ain't writing that many, but I'll fucking jump in and direct a Star Trek because I loved Star Trek when I was a kid. You know, he, in his mind, he's, he's kind of built his own mythos and legend, like even as, in as much as whenever you see the trailers, it's like the 10th film by Quentin Tarantino. He's definitely keeping track. Um, and he's got some sort of model in his head, but maybe this allows him to still keep to that model he's kept to his entire career but also go like, oh, I can play outside of it with things that I care about, characters and, and IP that I give a shit about that I was raised on. Yeah, I mean, I, I long to see him do something in the science fiction world because I think that he could do something amazing science fiction. And ironically, Star Trek is the most Western science fiction thing ever, and he right. loves fucking Westerns more than I love fucking Westerns, but good for you, Quentin. You Three hours in a fucking Western, go for it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it makes all the fucking sense in the world. Like, and I love the idea of a filmmaker, a lot like Steven Soderbergh, who decided, I want to make every kind of movie there is. Why not? I want to make a Western sci-fi. I want to make a World War II romance. I want to make a spy thing. I want to make a heist movie. I want to make a tiny fucking disease movie. Like, whatever it is, I want to try it. If Quentin has that itch and wants to get out of the Old West, and I want to make something with spaceships. All for it. Mm. Uh, big news, great news across the board. At first when I saw it, I was like, this is fucking fake news, but it was real news. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was like, this is fucking enjoyable, man. It sounds like something that was made up, but fuck, it's, it's the real deal. I hope it continues. I think JJ deserves, like, you know, all the fucking credit for, like, immediately, like, how we all know about that, somebody fucking talked. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it might have been JJ going, fucking spread the word, man. <laughs> Oh my God, a Quentin Tarantino Star Trek movie would be amazing. Talk about a way to reinvigorate a franchise. And, mm -hmm. and if it works with him, like give it to others. I, and believe me, I ain't lobby. I'm not like, give it to Silent Bob. I'd ruin it. But I mean, like if you give it to Quentin, maybe other filmmakers. Like, you know, it's not without precedent. Sam Mendes did, you know, American Beauty. Mm -hmm. And then he wound up doing fucking James Bond, which is about as mainstream as it gets and stuff. So I, 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 think, I think this could be the beginning of something, man. That's kind of cool. Yeah. I like it. That'd be awesome. Uh, we got two things out of the Netflix world. Okay. Uh, the most obvious thing in the world is that there will be a third season of Stranger Things. Right on. What a shock. Yeah. I'm I know. sure they were all sitting there sweating it. Uh, uh, the, the Duffer Brothers have said that the, sec the third season will involve a time jump because it takes them X amount of years to write and direct and produce a season of the show, and these kids are getting older, and yeah. they can't stop them from aging. So I think it's going to, it's not going to be a year in the life of these kids anymore. We might have to skip a couple of years just because. And they're all signed for six years, I think, mm. um, with renegotiations happening after the next season. But we are absolutely getting Stranger Things Volume 3. Fuck yeah, you'll be getting Stranger Things until like, you're like, I fucking hate this show. <laughs> and then you'll get three more seasons. Yeah. It's like, I don't want to watch them get jobs. This is bullshit. Um, I, they could go for a long fucking time. I mean, that's obviously it's something that's crafted with love and affection, and they're not making them crank it out hard. Right. Where they're like, "Hey, man, we need another one." Fucking stat. If they're letting them time jump and stuff like that, like you know, they're giving them space to create. So good for those cats. Yeah. And uh, remember, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Yeah. Netflix gave it a two-season order. Oh shit! So it's not even a CW. It's show? It's not even a CW show. Because Riverdale on the CW yeah. performed incredibly well on Netflix over the summer, to the point where more people watched it on Netflix than watched it on the CW. And so, <laughs> oh my God, are yeah. you shitting me? Yeah, CW is like, how do we do it? Tell us, Netflix. The the second season premiere of of Riverdale, of Riverdale was sixty percent higher ratings than the first season. Predominantly they got the Netflix bump. They got the Netflix the Netflix bumps. So and Netflix was like, fuck it, let's if we're gonna create an Archie universe. Let's, let's do it. Let's own it. And that's what they're doing. So 20 episodes out of the gate. Wow. And that was actually a really good concept for a show. It sounds fucking dope. Yeah. Like doing Sabrina by way of Rosemary's Baby. Yeah. So it's not like, I've got a talking cat. Or maybe, it'll, maybe she will have a talking cat, but the cat will be like, fucking Satan, bitch. <laughs> um, 
I, I, I like the idea. I mean, I guess they do it in the comics. There is a comic book version of this. Yeah. And um, there's, I mean, they're excited because there's 5,000 some odd characters in the Archie universe. And if they're just going to start plucking them and creating their own interconnected, interweavy fucking thing, why not? Then you get an Avengers kind of movie going. I know. Josie and the Pussycats, and they all got out of space. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> that's a good idea. And they why fight wouldn't Thanos. You do that? um, that's fucking badass. Good for them, man. That means they'll probably be able to curse a little bit, too. They'll be yeah. a bit more liberal there than they can be on CW. I think so. I think so. Although they will have to sell it internationally, but who gives a shit? Right. I think it'll sell. Foreigners. Um, what else we got? Uh, <laughs> they seem to still want to make a He-Man movie for reasons that boggle the mind. But Because there's a whole generation. It's not us. It came right after us. of Kids who like, that's their fucking Star Wars. They love the, They had all the toys and shit like that. Bought Man-at-Arms a couple times. I mean, I would like to direct them to Star Wars. Instead of fucking Masters of the Universe. Like, hey, you love that. Here's the way fucking better version of that. <laughs> I don't know. But I, I, I was never a, a He-Man cartoon guy. But I did like that canon movie they made. The Masters of the Universe. <laughs> I think it's fucking dope. It's a Dolph well, Lundgren. It's all about the fucking Dolph. For the time it was made, like, there was actual attention to detail. And, like... They made Courtney Cox's in it and stuff. It, it, it fucking works. And at the fight at the end, like you got Frank Langella hamming it up as Skeletor. And he's like, let this be our final battle. And he fucking, I'm not even a He-Man fan. I was like, do it, He-Man, kill him. <laughs> this is a pretty good flick, man. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, who's, who's doing it? Uh, David Goyer is oh, going fuck. to direct. He's, yeah. He did the, he did, uh, he worked with uh, Chris <laughs> Nolan. <laughs> He worked with Nolan on, on those Batman on movies. On those Batman movies. And he uh, directed Blade Trinity. Yeah. Which, and he did know. the movie where the dude's a ghost and shit like that. Has to solve his own death. I forget what that was called. He's directed before. So he would direct yeah. this as well? He would direct it. He's signed on to direct and rewrite the script. The most recent draft is by Mick G. Oh, Mick G did a draft yeah. of He-Man? Uh-huh. Yeah. So that's a movie that at some point will probably never happen. But... Hey, Hollywood, you guys. Dude, you want to talk about a fucking thick universe of characters. They had a bunch of characters. They do. There's a green And then you tiger. can spin it off to She-Ra as well. Yes, you could. <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely could. It's going to happen. Man in arms coming at you. Like it or not. Stinkor, <laughs> the movie. Um, I mean, I want Thundercats before I want Masters of the Universe, but that's just me. Really? Yeah. I think you'll probably get this before you get Thundercats. This is more mainstream. I bet you if you just looked at toy sales alone, He-Man sold more than Thundercats. I think we will get Cyborg 3 before we get either. But <laughs> <laughs> Is there any more news? That is all the news that's fit to print, my friend. That's the news you got? Yeah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we got a guest tonight that we didn't tell you all about. Uh, I, was, uh, I went out to eat with my lady the other day. Went to one of my favorite restaurants in town. Uh, Merrick's, which is, uh, they serve like Tex-Mex food uh, behind Basics. It's right over on Santa Monica Boulevard. Uh, I fell in love with the place. I like the dining there. Music is always fucking popping, 80s hard and shit like that. And my wife is like, I think you like it best because it's predominantly gay. But uh, I, I, it's a fantastic fucking place. I come in, maybe it's because I'm a bear in that world and like they treat me real sweet and whatnot. I get all the <laughs> chips I want. So it's, uh, it's one of my favorite places. So I went out there, I went to eat the other night and while we were there, uh, I walked in. I don't look around. I generally just kind of you know, go to the table and sit down and try to look at my wife. So I didn't look around when I walked in and then a dude comes over to the table and says hi. And it was like, one of my favorite fucking creators on the planet. And I was like, holy fuck, what are you doing here? He's like, we like eating here. Me and my lady come here all the time. I was like, oh my God. So I think him and I are both total closet cases because we both (laughs) love eating at this boy's eatery and stuff like that. It's pretty tremendous, man. But he, I said, he's, he's in town promoting a show. He's got a new TV show that's about to start airing on sci-fi. So I said, oh my God, dude, are you going to be in town this week? Come be on Fat Man on Batman. He's been on Fat Man on Batman before at home and did one of the greatest episodes of the show that people still talk about to, uh, to me to death today, both online and in person and shit like that. So uh, without further ado, here to talk about his show that's debuting on Sci-Fi called Happy based on his comic book. Give it up for the one, the only, the living icon of fucking comics and thought, Grant Morrison, ladies and gentlemen. 
Jim Bonham. Well, this, is, this is some swag for you. I get this. Yeah, you guys can fight over this. You know, like that scene in <laughs> Women in Love? Yes. Where it's Alan Bates and Oliver Reed and they have to wrestle in front of the fire. That's what we want to see next week. <laughs> over I this. Was, yeah. Couple this bear on bear action. <laughs> You'll totally see it. Step in between us, yeah, right? You get in the middle. middle Since we're talking about Marix. Jump in, jump in there. All right. You're in the space. Otherwise, nobody can see it. Um, so that He Man movie. It was new. Camera, you gotta face yeah. it, otherwise oh, everybody be mad. <laughs> <laughs> we got the back of Grant Morrison's head for two hours. He's, he's a hard man not to stare at, you know, it's kinda. <laughs> but that, that He-Man movie was New Gods. New Gods. Was New Gods. It, think about it, it was like... The, the old one, the one from canon. Yeah, the Boom Tube and, and Skeletor was Dark Side. That's right, they, it used it, they called it the Cosmic Key, but yeah, really it was, it was the exact, Mother Box. It, it, was, it was Kirby again, Kirby was there. They stole from yeah, Kirby, yeah. As usual, does. as usual. Um, you uh, have a huge, long storied uh, career, uh, and we've talked about the character of Batman, deep cuts yeah. on Fat Man Batman. The last time you were on the show, I think you were headed toward the Wonder Woman project. That happened? Yeah, yeah, I did that. I mean, did the first book. We've almost finished the second one. Yannick Paquette is kind of on the last 40 pages. And it, it, it's the Empire Strikes Back of the trilogy. It's, it's the, the fucked up. Uh, Everything goes to hell. <laughs> <laughs> was, and after post, you saw the Wonder Woman movie? Yeah, yeah. What did you think? I liked it. I thought she was, uh, the, the actress, Gal Gadot, was really likable. Right. Like, she was totally rooting for the girl. Chris Pine was great. Two of them together were great. But I'm, I'm looking at the Amazons, and I'm thinking, look, so you've had 3,000 years, and these women haven't developed a washing machine yet. <laughs> and it's kind of... My take on the Amazons goes back to William Moulton Marston's original, which was in 3,000 years they developed philosophy, they developed flying machines, they got purple rays that can heal the dead, you know, they can do all this stuff. So I kind of like the idea that the Amazons pose a threat, or pose at least an alternative. Right. And I felt that in the movie when, when Diana, and, and this, I mean, this isn't even my take on it, it's my wife, Chris, and honestly, she went to see this and she said, Diana goes in there and she takes on the generals and it's like, you shouldn't be doing this, and she stomps in. But it's from a place of naivety. She doesn't get the culture. She's a fish out of water. She, it's not like she has a credible alternative. And I think in those early Marston stories, the Amazons were a credit, credible feminist alternative to masculine culture, and that's what's kind of missing from the, the movie. They haven't developed in 3,000 years. They're still riding horses and whacking each other with leather swords. You know, and it's kind of... That wouldn't have happened, you know. It's, it seems it's, it's not enough, you know, to just say women would have stopped there and right. not developed a culture. So that's what I kind of missed from it. But I thought as, as, a, as a movie, it was great. The, the leads were great. And, I mean, what do you think? I dug it, I, but, but I did, like, I was talking to my friend about it just recently who hadn't, uh, he, we, we, I hadn't spoken to him since it came out. And um, he hadn't seen it. And he goes, did they do the invisible jet? And I was yeah. like, bro, they didn't even call her Wonder Woman. <laughs> like, not once in the movie. They always call her Diana, Diana mm -hmm. and stuff. So I, in their version, like, uh, uh, we call the Paradise Island when we were kids. Themyscira, they don't have yeah. the tech, at least as presented in the movie. Whereas in the comics, she left the island with the invisible jet. Like, it was from there. Isn't yeah, it? I mean, I mean, these, these, these women had, like I say, they had the medical technology, they had invisible jets, they had, you know, planes that were beyond supersonic speed, and I kind of liked that, you know, Hippolyta had her magic mirror, and she could see anything happening anywhere, any time, and that kind of, that, I wish there'd been a bit more of that, so that they were an actual credible alternative to the patriarchy. Right. <clears throat> Um, let's talk about Batman real quick, because you got a lot of history yeah. with Batman. Uh, you had this historic run on Batman where he was gone. Uh, Dark Side got rid of him at one point, and so then Dick became Batman, yeah, yeah. and Damien, the character you created, uh, mm -hmm. became Robin, and then Batman franchised and did Batman Inc. and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. at any given point, like uh, w working with DC, whatever, like you can't do that. Don't do that. Please don't do that. Because it seems like they let you do whatever no, you want. No, they just kind of lay back and say, oh, please, you know, just, just do your thing. Because it worked, you know, as long as the things work. And it, it always baffles me. So I tell you, how the hell did that work at all? But when it works, it, it, that's, that's its own reward. And, and DC were happy to just say, okay, it, it worked. Keep doing this. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. And I still look back and how the fuck did I get away with that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, we had a debate last yeah. week 
about uh, casting of Batman because Ben Affleck wants to leave and he's yeah. not interested. It's too hard being Batman. The cow's too heavy. Whatever. And uh, and so the cow's too heavy. <laughs> yeah. Heavy is the head that wears the cowl. <laughs> and uh, and so we got into a little bit of a debate about whether or not a black actor could play Bruce Wayne. Mm-hmm. I. I, oddly enough, felt that it, it needed to be a white actor because of who Batman is, because of the legacy of old money, because of the responsibility that the yeah, Wayne yeah, family yeah, had yeah. built in for generations yeah. that the Waynes and Gotham are intertwined yeah. and so on and so on. He was like, I want Andrew Elba. Where do you come down on that particular well, debate? Everybody's going to say Idris, aren't they? It's like if, it's, <laughs> if it's Doctor Who, it's Idris. If it's like Han Solo, it's Idris. It's, so yeah, I mean, yeah, he'd, he'd sure he'd be a great Batman, but I guess I'm with you. I think Batman's representative of a whole class of, of sorry, a whole class of people who are, uh, you know, that East Coast wealthy, white, rich, and he, I kind of love the tension that he he, he does. He, he fights crime. He beats up junkies, and he's a billionaire. And it's n- that's not all he does, obviously, and it's a reductive reading to say, you know, it's a Marxist kind of reading of Batman to say that's all he does. But it's still in there and it adds attention, I think. I don't think you'd get that if it was Idris Elba. I don't think you'd get the same. There's something unhealthy and unholy about Batman, you know, at a certain <laughs> level. <laughs> um, all right, let's talk happy. When you were over my house yeah. last time, you brought the first issue of the comic, and you were like, hey, this is something I'm working on. Check it out. And um, it's now a fucking TV show. Yeah, it's not. How did that happen? Well, it just happened over a long period of time. You know how these things work. It it happened over years, and it seems like instant, because now there's billboards at last. But uh, it happened over a long time. You know, we had a bunch of people who were into it. Brian Crow over at UCP, and then... And the guys at Original Film. Mm. And then they brought in Brian Taylor, and I was totally into the Crank movies, you know, especially that Crank 2, which I really loved. Mm. So Brian and I worked on the pilot, and it took the usual years of development, and then Thing Catches Fire, you know, last year we were in New York, and it was <laughs> minus 10 degrees in the middle of the night doing these overnight sequences, and I just thought, how the hell did I get myself into this? I usually sit in a little tower in Scotland overlooking the water with cats playing about, and everything's cool. And now I'm swaddled up in this tent in Manhattan, minus 10 degrees, my, like my eyelids were freezing. But so the, we, we did the show then, and the funny thing was that once it was picked up, they had to shoot this Christmas show in, in, in August in New York. So it's the most amazing, it's utterly convincing. You believe it was winter. They managed to cheat out of the trees and people walking by in their, their, their shorts. They're gone. It's, it's utterly convincing, but it, it was uh, it was a weird one. Once it happened, it happened like a train. Explain the concept mm-hmm. of the show uh, for those at home completely unfamiliar with the concept. It starts yeah. on Sci-Fi when? It's in Sci-Fi tomorrow night. Actually, tomorrow night. Yeah. So the the, the, the story is uh, simple. <laughs> it's it's about a, an ex-cop who's uh, he was once a great cop and he's fallen from grace. He's now ended up working, uh, doing hits for the mob to finance his love of drugs and, and, and eczema cream and all kinds of things that are <laughs> completely cream. unsavory. So he's doing a hit one night and everything goes wrong. He shoots the wrong guy and he has a heart attack. And when he wakes up in the ambulance, there's a little blue unicorn hovering above him, unicorn with wings, you know, like the kind of unicorns you usually see when you've got the DTs. And the unicorn tells him it's a little girl's imaginary friend. And no one else in the world can see this unicorn except our hero, Nick Sachs, this, this fallen cop. And suddenly he has to ask himself, am I hallucinating? Is this for real? And the unicorn says, we have to save this kid. Something really bad is going to happen to this kid before Christmas. And we have to save her. And that's kind of the, the, the basic plot of this thing. And then it, it spirals off. It goes off in directions quite different from the, the original graphic novel. It gets quite cosmic and weird. So we're excited. How, how were the conversations with sci-fi? Yeah. Like, given the intensity of the material, like I saw the pilot earlier today. Yeah, yeah. And it's fucking bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's way extreme for even like basic cable. What were those conversations like? Like how much did no, they, they push they, back? They, it was amazing. They were actually really, you know, they, they just said we we want to we want to we want to take this as far as you guys can take it, and they didn't pull much back. I mean, there are scenes in there that are coming up which are it's ludicrous. There's been nothing like them on television, and possibly shouldn't ever have been anything like it on television. <laughs> but it's too late now. So no, they, they, they were super supportive, and I think what 
kind of sold it. Because, I mean, you've seen it, so the, 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 the violence is quite extreme. But at the same time, it has a cartoon quality. And Chris Maloney just brings this... It's, he's so likeable that he could be mashing a man's head in with a fire extinguisher, and you still think he's a really nice guy and you want to be his friend. So I think he brought something really special to the role, and that absolved us of a lot of crimes, <laughs> you know, things that in another show could have been really bleak and violent, and this show are kind of Tom and Jerry. What, uh, what was your process in, I guess, the collaboration of it all, given that comics is very much from your pen to the page, to the artist, to the reader? there's not a lot of layers between your intent and the final yeah, product. Yeah. But television is, there's 87 different layers. Like, how did you find that process? I, I enjoyed it, honestly. It was just like translation, you know. I, I like the idea of taking a story and doing a version of it. Because I think stories are always malleable. They can always change. They're never set in stone. So I kind of just got into the idea of, of working with people. And initially, it was just me and Brian doing the, the, the pilot. So I kind of learned a lot about how to do the television. And then we were in the writer's room with a whole bunch of other writers who were throwing ideas in the pot. And that was great because you can just sit back for the entire day and they do all the work. Which <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not like comics where the deadline's on and you have to have this thing finished in eight hours. You know, there's, there's eight other people who've thrown ideas in. So actually, uh, I really enjoyed the process and I love being able to translate this story in a completely different medium and play up to the strengths of television rather than comics and kind of expand the mythology and, and build it out. Does it, does it sort of excite you about maybe taking some of your other work and trying to translate it to TV? Like I think <coughs> there's a fantastic We Three TV show to be made. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th I think that would be great. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them. It's always, always the ones that people say it's completely unfilmable. Those are the ones I want to do, you know? So I <laughs> like The Invisibles and The Filth and Sea Guy, and I have takes on them. But, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll see what happens. Once this hopefully opens the doors, if it does, you know, people are into it, and I hope they are, then, yeah, I mean, I'm sure other things might happen. But, but yeah, the, it's the, the unfilmable ones <laughs> are the ones I really want to do. What, um, what of your stuff in the past have you seen translated to another medium? Uh, nothing, nothing. This is the first? Yeah, yeah, this is the first one. It was, it was All Star Superman. They did the, the animated version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dwayne McDuffie did a really yeah. great job on that movie. That, that was the first thing I'd seen that had any of my kind of dialogue brought to life by actors. So this was the first time, and I was, you know, hanging about with actors, and I, I really enjoyed that whole thing, talking to them and, and, and getting their take on things and the way they would improv and create characters. It Chris Maloney, hold on, Chris Maloney yeah. is the cop? Yeah, he's the lead. Gone bad. And yeah. who's doing the voice of the... You know, Patton, Patton Oswalt. Patton Oswalt's yeah, yeah. doing the voice. Oh my God, that's awesome. That's kind of perfect. No, he is. He, he just nails it. It's <laughs> so good. good. It just boggles yeah. the mind that, that there is such a deep catalog of your work, mm -hmm. both creator owned and even in D.C., that this is the first thing. Yeah. And yeah. In D.C. is not just like, fuck it, let's give this dude a channel. Like, we could do Grant Morrison all day, every day, yeah, and it's, I mean, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, I mean, and, and this is the one that most people would think is kind of least definitive of my work. And, and the weird thing with the TV show is once we expand it out, it's become way more like my kind of stuff, you know? So it's a lot more, it's bigger mythology, there's bigger stuff going on. But it's weird that this was the one that, that is so probably non-representative of what I do is the one that kind of opened the door. Grant wrote yeah. one of my all-time favorite stories, not even just comic books, yeah, yeah. just stories <clears throat> in the world with Rock of Ages on that JLA run. Oh, yeah. Oh, my so. God. <clears throat> Still, uh, to this day, like, can make me well up by the time you get to the Black Racer um, issue. Just such a well-told yeah. fucking story. And that version of Batman who'd been broken mutilated and, by, by decide, decide. Yeah. and then finally and yeah. went through like a decade or more yeah, of mutilation yeah. just to outlive him and just to eventually break him yeah and then he punches out metron as well he <laughs> yes punches, punches out and you go with the logic he was just yeah. like you don't know what it's like to to be real you've never made you know make and, yourself and metron flesh. wants all knowledge so he needs the knowledge of what does it feel like to be human well become human and you'll learn that the minute metron becomes human batman punches him. <laughs> <laughs> um that <laughs> concepts yeah. like um Remember when they were with the in the beginning of the story of the Whirly Gig or Whirly God, yeah, yeah. they were trapped inside 
the Joker's brain and or or no, they were oh, trapped yeah, yeah, in a yeah. place where he was like, well, John Jones, the Martian Manhunter, was like, I can create a frontal lobe that's like that mimics the, the Joker, yeah. mimics the Joker, so I can. <laughs> think like a psychopath yeah. and find our way out of here. And he was like, give me a moment. And there's just a shot of him like, and it's not like his head changes. But then he just goes, huh, this way. And starts yeah. leading him. And he said like at one point, he's like, his, his thinking is terrifying. Like just having the thoughts. It was such a fucking cool concept. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, there's that story, which I feel like would be an amazing fucking movie. Mm -hmm. But honestly, probably like your most famous work that screams to be adapted as a movie. And in a world where, you know, we were talking about which direction to take the Warner Brothers movies, yeah. Batman Arkham Asylum would be fucking fantastic. You get to showcase yeah, yeah. the entire rogues gallery. It's a great, simple concept. Mm -hmm. And you want to talk about, like, cheap? Like, it's one, you're basically, in, you're in Arkham. Yeah, like that's a build a, a warehouse. Build a build a warehouse. <laughs> it could be like a totally Logan stripped down fucking version of one man in a weird suit and a bunch of weird people in a fucking scary place. And like in a world where you see that trailer for that new mutants movie where mm -hmm, they've taken mm -hmm. a horror movie approach, yeah, yeah. that's what you would take yeah, with that. Just, like just, Batman just, is a horror movie. Just to see what it was like, and I think it would work, you know. But but who would do it? Who do you think would do it? So. But it's cheap as fuck, too. Yeah. That movie costs fifteen million dollars. I, I mean honestly, it's Warner Brothers, so let's be honest. Fifty, but that's 50. cheap for them. <laughs> <laughs> you know we don't know how to spend fifteen million. And Jason the, Blum could make that movie. The, for the $4 game million. the game yeah, the right. game was great, you know. So they proved that they could do something with it which is a lot more more you know, populist and easier to digest. And, right. But yeah, if they took that basic substance, but you'd want some, you'd, I, I don't know, you'd want some weird 1930s surrealist to direct that one. Yes, yes, you want somebody fucked up yeah. and on drugs. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying give me the job, I'm just saying <laughs> you need a real visionary on that. Could you imagine yeah, fucking so like Throw a dart and you'll hit one. It's <laughs> yes. Um, Fincher doing fucking yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Arkham Asylum. Yeah. Who do you think? Fuck, it's hard to beat Fincher. David Lynch. David Lynch. That oh, twin, fuck. That twin Peaks. <laughs> David Lynch. Oh, well, yeah. hold on. Maybe not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> I'd, see, I'd see a version from Lynch, but I don't know about we want to give him Markham Asylum, man. <laughs> First three episodes will be... Hmm. Who? Aronofsky. 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 Um, Possibly. He wanted to do yeah, year yeah, one yeah. in a big, bad way, and, and but, but then didn't wind up doing it. Yeah, I'd watch it. Mother was... I thought Mother was interesting as fuck and, and also bold as shit. So yeah, why not him? Um, all right, man. That's, uh, so when can they watch? And is it all done? Is it one of these shows that's like we did 10 episodes and we're finished? Well, we did eight and it's, uh, that's the first season, but it's all set around Christmas. So it's kind of, it's, it's a wonderful life for this new generation of ours. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, yeah, it starts tomorrow night and uh, I hope people dig it. I mean, it's, it, it goes from this, like I say, a hyper violence to absolute E.T. style sentimentality where the tears will be running down your face because Tinkerbell's dying. And it's like, so we kind of cover everything and I'm, I'm kind of interested to see what people think. Um, I know, I remember when I was at San Diego uh, this summer for IMDb, a friend of mine yeah. saw me and was like, I just got cast on Happy. And I was like, get the fuck out of here. They're making Happy. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, Joe Reitman. Who, who's, oh, Joe's great. Yeah, I mean, Joe's he's wonderful. Like, he's the dude from, if you saw Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, he was the first day D when Chris Rock was like, this movie is going to make House Party look like House Party 2. And he went, for <laughs> House Party 3. You know? And he was like, shut the fuck up. He goes, yes, sir. <laughs> so who's he playing in this? He's the Santa guy? Yeah, he's playing the, 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 just the most corrupt Santa you've ever seen. And the costume design's great. The, the, the designs are like Batman villains. You know, the, the Santa's amazing. He's just covered in all this Christmas shit that he's been accumulating for years. So it's like a crab. And he's built this shell around him. And, and poor Joe, the, the the coat w weighed about three times Joe's weight, and he was dragging it around the place. The and costume kind of, itself. Yeah, the costume heavy. was insane. It, it's like solid. You know, you could live in it. It's like an igloo. It's it's amazing, but it's covered in stuff. It's covered in dolls and burned out faces and Christmas things. So it's amazing costume. What is it like to see mm. like, and and again like this is not the most obvious choice in the world of everything no, you've created yeah. to go first. What is it like to see something that you probably never thought would be fucking turned into something before some of the other things? Yeah, you well, what do you think? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's like, what the fuck? It's, it's, it's a total what the fuck. Yeah. Um, and seeing those, seeing those uh, posters on Sunset, 
Because that was, are everywhere. If you're yeah, not that, here that in Los was Angeles, that, that, that was like this thing where I'd always imagined going down that street and there would be something there up there eventually, you know. And suddenly to see it was like it was being pitched into hallucination. <laughs> Fuck. Um, well, congratulations. That's oh, fucking thanks, awesome. Uh, you want to stick around for Q and A? Yeah, sure. So we can open it up to to you as well. All right, folks. We're now about to enter the Q and A portion of uh, Fat Man on Batman, and I brought <laughs> some fucking <laughs> gifts. Uh, <laughs> not from Whole Foods, it's just a Whole Foods bag. Um, for the choosing. Uh, when you ask a question, you get to pick from this fine array of stuff. We got a pop, we got some Injustice figures, we got Harley Quinn Hulu uh, girl, uh, and we got Batman socks. So if your question's worthy enough, we don't have 40X tickets this Is that week. like Frankenstein? Oh, that's cool. Which one? Is that Frankenstein? The Where? Which one? That's Solomon one, yeah. Grundy. Oh, Solomon, Solomon Grundy. Grundy. Oh, too bad. They go oh, my God. Grundy. They're going to take yeah. your DC card away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Solomon um, Grundy never looked like that ever. It's no, it's, it's somebody else's. It's an injustice <laughs> rendering of Solomon Grundy. Um, all right, JC, you got a mic? Yep. Mike is live. Throw your hands in the air. Wave like it just don't care. You pick somebody already? Bang, you got somebody. We're starting off. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys doing? So good. Yeah. Awesome. You have a question for Mr. Morrison. Yeah, for all three of you, actually. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. That's the question. Yeah. My like. question is, with, uh, with Infinity War being pretty much the end all, the be all, especially for this phase and everything, st um, studios building everything up, mm -hmm. you guys as writers and creators and just overall awesome people, um, well, how do you, do you feel now since everybody's on, like, pretty much the same page you've you know been knocking stuff out of the park with the exception of certain movies which we won't talk about but um, two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question for you guys do you think it was more that the writers and producers on the shows like american gods game of thrones the cw shows the guys that work for feige and all them is it just their you know it's just that they get it and they realize it or is it more of a right place right time type of thing and do you guys feel that where, where we will end up in the future? Is it just going to get better, or is it a part that part might get worse? I think for me, in terms of like, Marvel's <clears throat> easy to point to. It seems obvious. Like they've got a showrunner, like Mark said. Like Kevin Feige's telling one long story, and everybody gets to make their movies within that big story. But he's got a long con going, and it's going to pan out for him. And I think the other thing they do that's interesting is whenever I look at the credits, I never see a writer's name where I'm like, oh, it's that person. Like, they're, they're willing to take, take new talent on because old talent, I suspect, this might have something to do with it, aside from being expensive and shit, but old talent, I'm, and I'm not including myself in that. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just saying, like, there's a bunch of names, say 20 names, like, of the highest paid screenwriters. They don't go after those cats. They kind of go after people who don't cost as much, but more importantly, they go after cats where they could be like, this is what the story is going to be, work within those parameters. And I think if you went to people who were like, oh, I wrote this and I wrote that, they don't want to have terms dictated to them. But I think it works better if you've got somebody in the God seat going like, these are all the beats you got to hit within your story. Everything else, go crazy, do that. So I think they're, I think they're, they're doing the smart thing. They're not using the same fucking writers that have been used over and over again. They're using fresh names. and, and while they let them do their movies, clearly, you know, Thor uh, three, uh, 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 Thor Ragnarok marched to the beat of its own drum, but it still also had all the beats needed to get us to uh, Black Panther and, you know, Avengers Infinity War. There's still a story being told underneath that story. I think that's the smart way to go for, for these movies, <coughs> particularly. I don't think you could do that or should do that with, you know, fucking other flicks, but with comic book movies that you want to connect a universe the way they're doing, that seems to work. You guys? Yeah, I just think that the formula gets better. You know, they figure it out, each new one, they figure out how to make those connections, how to make them better, how to make them clearer. And it's like algorithms, you know, soon machines will be writing these movies and they'll be even <laughs> better. They've already got programs that are doing this stuff. So that they, they're kind of, each one of these movies, it's like, it's more refined, it's more perfectly tuned to what the audience are looking for. And they'll just keep doing that. I mean, who knows what the pinnacle of that will be. A, a Thor movie so beautiful, it breaks our hearts and kills us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that at some point, every story has to end. You know, like a, a, every good story needs the, the final act. Right. And 
I'm very curious what Marvel's final act is going to be and when they're going to start nudging us mm. towards that. I mean, there was the point, like, we all loved the first season of Lost. We all kind of endured the second season of Lost. But by the third season of Lost, you're like, you got to come up with where the last season of Lost is. We can't be here indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And only when they decided there is where we're going. They pointed to the fucking bleachers and said, I'm going to hit a shot there. Do you start to get actual story resonance? Do you actually start to get it to mean something by the end of it? So I'm really curious where Kevin Feige, how much longer this long con is going to go on for. And these movies are good because they're what they need to be. You know, like they're not trying to, I mean, fucking it's why Thor Ragnarok was so good because it felt like it's what it demanded to be. It's why Guardians was so good because it was, this movie needs to be this thing. And we're going to do that version of it to the best we possibly can. It's why Deadpool worked so well and why attempts at mimicking Deadpool don't work so well because they knew what Deadpool was and made the best version of that thing. So, yeah, I'm just really curious to know when and what the final act looks like. You win a prize. Give him a round of applause, Woo! ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Take us someplace, JC. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? So fucking good. <laughs> uh, my question is for Mr. Morrison. Hey, yeah. hey, dude. Uh, back at Comic Con, you talked about doing an Arkham Asylum sequel. Yep. Uh, any indication as to when that might be released? Wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> what is it? What would it be? I mean, don't give us a story, but what? What? No, it's, it's basically, I was talking to Chris Burnham and he, he wanted to do some Batman again. I said, look, I always thought that when I was completely jumping the shark and my career was over, I would do Arkham Asylum 2. <laughs> so, <laughs> are we there? So let's do it. And we come up with this idea and we just really wanted to do it. And it's kind of, all, all I can say so far, is it's... It's the kind of Damien version of Batman. It's in the future, but we're not doing any of that dystopian stuff. I want it to be like a, a French graphic novel, like one of those Dwee, you know, Mobius things, like, or yeah. like Valerian. I love Valerian, you know, it was like the, the, the worst, but I really loved it. And the we movie, did you see the movie? Yeah, yeah, I thought I it was thought great. I thought she was really good in it, and I thought I, the I movie was fucking beautiful. The, it was the most amazing looking thing, and yeah. just filled with all that detail. So so Chris and I are going to do this thing, but he's uh, he's just working with Kirkman right now. He's about to finish the, the project, and we're starting it next year. But the, the idea is to just give him a long lead-in so that we can release it uh, what is it, a thousand years after the first one came out, whatever it is. It would be but an yeah. anniversary? Yeah, like two Would it be a one shot? Yeah, because 2019 is the 30th anniversary, so we want to. Are you shitting me? Yeah, but can you believe it? <laughs> Dude, I, I, like, it sounds weird to say, but like I remember driving to three different comic mm. book stores mm. to secure as many fucking copies as we could because the place yeah. we went to, we could only get one copy each, and we're like, well, I want one to open. Mm one to fucking put into my collection unopened, mm -hmm. and one to be able to deal to a comic book store yeah. when it goes up. So but we they were brilliant, they, they, they fell apart on, on contact. Those, those early editions of Arkham Asylum, you just open them and all the pages fall out. <laughs> it's, like a, there, yeah, it's like a pack of tarot cards, you just have to put them in in any order and but it still it makes so sense. so fucking classy, like yeah. nobody would remember it now because now it's the standard. Everyone mm -hmm. does hardcover books and yeah. they make these beautiful coffee table books, but mm -hmm. It was at an age where you were like, you were so proud to bring it into your home, like, and show your parents, mm -hmm. like, this is comic books, man, a classy book that could go on a shelf. See, it's art. <laughs> it just felt because it was hardcover with a slip, you know, a dust jacket, it just felt more legit. And then there was like gorgeous fucking art inside. That was a historic book 30 years ago. Yeah. Jesus. So the, the new one's going to come out and it'll be a complete, it'll deface the memory of the original. <laughs> In a perfect Morrison way. Yeah. That deserves a prize. Come get a prize. Give it up for that question. Hey. Woo. Where are we going next, JC? How are you, sir? Oh, uh, good. Thank you. Whoa. Oh, yeah. yeah, there we go. Hey. <laughs> uh, what's up, Mark? Hey. Um, yeah, really, I just wanted to thank you for Clerks. I wanted to thank you for Genius. And I want to thank Morrison, you know, for everything. Absolutely. But my, really, my question is like, for Mr. Morrison, how do you go between writing something like Multiversity and something like All Star Superman? Like, how do you, I don't know, fix your brain to write something where it's yeah. easy for everyone to get, and then something like Multiversity? I just I, I follow what I think that the story needs, you know. And sometimes the story leads down places that I wish it hadn't taken me, and and it's it gets weird or it gets 
kind of baroque or elaborate, but I just got to follow it. And with Superman, we were trying to do something really classical that would last for all time. Most of the other stuff I do, I just want it to be read. You know, I don't expect it to be remembered in, in five, ten years or whatever. I expect it to be obliterated. So it's kind of more like live performance. But Superman was seriously done to try and kind of, yeah, so it was designed to be timeless. So the other stuff is different. It's more like experiment. What can you do in a live performance? You know, you've got an idea for a superhero story. How far can you stretch the notes before it turns into something else? How far can you, you know, bend it before it changes? And most of these things, I, I kind of do them as experiments. I know, it's, you know, obviously sometimes the experiments might seem as if they've gone too far or they've failed, or, but I kind of just got to follow. You know, with Batman, it was all about the, the entire structure of that guy's career, like the entire history of Batman. Could we make that one guy's life? And all of them are the same. The Seven Soldiers was the idea. Could we do a super team where none of them ever meet, but the stories cross over? to this degree where actually they managed to beat the villains without ever crossing paths. And all of them are just like, how did I do this? Justice League was like myths, you know, I could go on all night. It's like <laughs> X-Men was a soap opera and I was really pushing myself to experience these miserable emotions. <laughs> <laughs> and all of them, you're just you're following, okay, what's the format? It's, it's, a soap opera is really different from telling the mythological tales of the Justice League. and. You know, a, a diary comic like The Invisibles is, is very different from doing, you know, a, a Wii 3, which is, okay, it's an animal story and it's like a distinct begin, middle and end. So, honestly, it's form dictates content, or is it content dictates form, whatever. It's, it's, that's how, what does the story need? What is it, where does it want to go? What's it asking for? And, and how, how distorted can the medium be to carry that story, if need be? Hence, things like Final Crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question, Good question. Man. Pick yeah. a fucking prize. Give it up for it. <laughs> hey, I got a question before we jump back into the audience. So uh, you talked about it on the, on the <clears throat> podcast when you were on my show once, but since uh, uh, Krista over here has merged with the Infinite at one yeah, point, yeah. didn't you have... Yeah, I messed the fuck out of the Infinite. <laughs> <laughs> You've had experiences yeah, yeah, with the absolutely, Infinite. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, tell them about, about the story, like, and it ties into Arkham Asylum. <clears throat> you told me about the story where you guys made so much money from Arkham Asylum, you were like, let's go to... Let's go. Yeah, it was, it was Kathmandu, and, and you know, I'd, I'd been doing a lot of uh, like occult stuff and magic stuff before that. And again, I'll, I'll try and condense this because it, it turns into kind of the greatest hit of this fucking story again. But the idea was we saw this, this guy on a, a TV show, a BBC TV show, this art historian, Dan Cruikshank, and he was talking about the Buddha and walking in the footsteps of the Buddha. And there's this temple in Nepal called Shwayambunath, which apparently you have, if you can climb the stairs there, it's 8 billion times more holy than anywhere else on Earth. And 365 stairs, if you can do it on one lung full of air, you're guaranteed enlightenment. So me and my friend were like, what, guaranteed enlightenment? For what, for a plane ticket? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we buy the ticket, we go to Kathmandu, we do the, the stairs. And it was, it was quite easy, you take a big breath and you go up the stairs. And basically a few days later, I was on the roof garden and this thing started to happen. And yeah, I mean, I like, I like what you were talking about, that being taken off the surface of, 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 of the four-dimensional universe and being able to rotate around and look back at it as a structure and see from a kind of five-dimensional perspective where all time and all space was contained in one simultaneous object. And everyone that I knew was there, but they were in the form of what seemed to be silver uh, metamorphing blobs of mercury. And when they passed through, you'd get entire emotional uh, symphonies of, of someone you'd known, like your mother, your father, it'd be as heavy. <gasps> so it seemed like a place, it seemed outside time. But what they said to me, which was interesting, they, they, they showed me the universe of time, and I said, what the fuck, why, why am I here? And they said, well, you asked for it. You ran up those stairs, you know. You, were <laughs> <laughs> you, you asked of your psychic ass kicked. And they just basically said, look, we make, in this world we live, it's five-dimensional, so it's beyond space, it's beyond time. We don't have time like you have time, so we can't grow things. The only way to grow something is to make time because that's where things grow. Things grow in time. They need time to grow. So they basically said, we grow our children, we select a planet in your universe and we plug a kid into it and it starts off as a single cell in the ocean and it grows 
and it grows for billions of years and it puts out all these fronds and ferns and it feels like distinct and individual. It's like all the fingers in a hand think they're separate, but they're actually not. They're all just part of the same hand. And they show me this thing and they just said, this huge entity that's living on your planet and has been surviving on your planet and feeding off your planet for the last three and a half billion years is about to grow up and turn into one of us. Now go back and tell everyone. <laughs> <laughs> No, it wasn't. It was actually no. I've, I've, I've had that. The question was, was no, it a DMT yeah, experience? But yeah, but and, and I mean that it makes in the interim. You know, I tried everything in the nineties after that experience. I tried everything to get back to this place because it was much more real than here. It was way more real than this. The the definition was way higher. It was like a thousand million bit, you know, computer simulation. It, the colours were so much purer. And this seems like a kind of flickering Charlie Chaplin film by comparison. So, yeah, I could never recreate the same experience, but it, it, it kind of fueled a lot of the work that I did for, for years in The Invisibles and stuff. And I'm still trying to figure out, was it a real vision? Was it a temporal lobe seizure? Is this what the afterlife looks like? Is this what the fifth dimension looks like? I still don't know. No idea. But all I, all I can do is that's, that's what happened. You know, That's what I saw. I fucking love that story. <laughs> Jesus, oh my God. And I just went to Hearst Castle and like <laughs> <laughs> took a fucking tour. <laughs> um, good luck following that question. Where are we going next, JC? Yeah. So we're here tonight in honor of my husband's birthday. Hey, happy birthday! Yeah. So I want to play his least favorite game, Remember When You Said. <laughs> so Kevin, in so many podcasts, you talk about how much you hate Tusk, and I I love Tusk. <laughs> I, I only joke about hating. It's my favorite thing I've ever done. Well, I wanted you to explain that process about how you talk about it in all the podcasts and, and how how it started, because I am not artistic and I've never created, so I wanted to hear your story about how was it was an execution or what people said about it because you often talk really negatively about it. Mm. But I also often very talk negatively about, you guys don't hear it as much anymore, mall rats. For the first 10 years of mall rats life, it was the redheaded stepchild and a punchline to many jokes. And then Jersey Girl took its place for a long time. <laughs> um, that was my first horror movie, I would say, before Red State or Tusk. And then Tusk took Jersey Girl's place, but only for a little while, because then yoga hosers beat them all. So <laughs> suddenly there was an easier go-to. Um, I always find it best to make fun of my shit before uh, somebody else does. I believe in stealing the thunder. If you, you know, I grew up <laughs> fat. So you, if you are in, in the schoolyard and you're like, I'm fat, then the bully doesn't call you fat. It's like, oh, he fucking knows it. And they move on and shit. So I've always been the person that's the first to make fun of his flicks. But I love them regardless. Like I, I, you know, they exist because I love them. I, I don't. I, I get that people can find flaws in them, but you know, I, I love them to death. They're exactly what I wanted them to be, or with based on the material I had to work with, or the budget, or something like that. Even Cop Out was a movie that, like, considering what a pain in the ass it was to shoot and how we had to kind of work through one of the leads. Like, I'm happy with the end result. My old man would have fucking loved that movie. Like, it was his kind of flick. He was dead when we made it, though. Never make a movie for a ghost. That's what I learned on that fucking movie. <laughs> so at the end of the day, I may kid them, but I fucking love the movie. I, I, I love Tusk to death. I think it's, it, too, is like Mallrats, where after Mallrats, for like the first two years, like people just shit on it, and then slowly the real audience kind of started appearing. First time I met the real audience for Tusk, I was at where? Ringling College in, uh, in, down in Sarasota an art college, like film students and shit like that. Not for clowns? Not for clowns. Uh, <laughs> they moved on. So they, that, that was where like, I met a bunch of people who were like, I fucking love Tusk. Or people who were like, I always thought you were bullshit until Tusk. That blew my mind. I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah, fuck clerks. What a sellout. And I'm like, that movie? <laughs> but I guess like Tusk is a completely different bar. So no, I, I love it to death. I make, I kid it, but it's also coming into it's like, it's aging well, as they say. I had a question for Mark, too. Hey. So you brought it up tonight about Batman couldn't be black. And mm. ever since I heard that in the podcast, it's been kind of like in the back of my mind. So I feel like the reason you said he couldn't be black was because of centuries of slavery and oppression and systematic racism. 
And in comics where we suspend so much reality, shouldn't that be where we correct history and kind of create the heroes that couldn't be because of the mistakes that we made? Or do you stand by that Batman just can't be black? Uh, I, I feel like it's less the systemic racism and ongoing sort of siege of bigotry. And more it's about, it's about old money. It's about Batman, about the Wayne family landing in the new world in the 17th century. <clears throat> And they, were, they built Gotham hand in hand with, with the other robber barons of their day. And the responsibility that the Wayne family over the course of that time feels for Gotham City. The, the fact that they preyed on it for centuries, the fact that they tried to help it for centuries, the fact that they, they bled for it and tried for it and stole from it for centuries. By the time Thomas Wayne comes of age and decides to stop being part of that legacy and becomes a surgeon and, and decides to give back, fully knowing and being cognizant of the fact that for centuries his family has done great things and bad things for the city. When Thomas Wayne has a son, he teaches that son to carry that forward. Like for those 11 years that Thomas Wayne is still in Bruce Wayne's life, it's you have a responsibility to this city, son. You can't just take from it, you have to give to it. He saw the Wayne Foundation and the charities and all that stuff. And so when the Waynes die, that kid, broken and crazy, internalizes all of that stuff to then become Batman. And I don't think you just get to be Batman like Oprah's kid. Should she ever have one? She's a billionaire, she's a black billionaire. There are no old black billionaires. There's brandy new ones. And if Oprah's kid decides that, oh shit, my parents got killed, he's not putting on a fucking costume and fighting crime. <laughs> that's not how that works because that's not built into him. That, the, that level of barnacle over the ages is not part of that story. So I think Batman, for that reason, needs to be that person. The same way Zorro needs to be a Spaniard. Like, you can't have an Indian Zorro. <clears throat> I'd love to see an Indian Zorro, but you can't do that. <laughs> because it's about old California. It's about landed gentry. It's about aristocrats. It's about all of that shit. And it's cultural specificity. And as long as you keep that, as long as you follow that thread, then that's all well <clears throat> and good. Zorro could be a lady. Absolutely. She could be Doña de la Vega as much as you could be Don de la Vega. But it's, it's, it's about what that character requires to be that character. <clears throat> Otherwise, <clears throat> it's somebody new. And that'd be awesome. New is great. Make a new hero for Idris Elba to play. And make him be the first and only as opposed to the seventh and best. But still, I think that there's that reason for me still holds water. That was fucking solid. Give it up for Mark, man. Whoa, that good. <clears throat> Some smart shit in there. All right, where are we going next? Oh, uh, you win a prize, by the way. Yeah. Fucking come up there and get that prize. Happy birthday, kid. Give him up. Give it up for him. He's a birthday kid. Yeah, let your lady do all the work. You get the present. Nice. We're all studying you now. Of course you took the big one. Well done. Well done. The Harley Quinn doll. Well done. All right, JC, where are we going? Kevin, Mark. Hey, Jeff this camp, love the show. Thank you. you do a great job. Great jersey, uh, my friend. Thank you, my brother. Go Kings, go. How are you doing? So good. Awesome. <laughs> Fucking metal. <laughs> <laughs> Two part question for you. Uh, first part, uh, can I get a picture with you after the show? Absolutely. Second part, if you were to get a tattoo of your favorite comic book character, what would it be and where? Um, fuck. I guess, I mean, it sounds, it's kind of the standard answer, but I'm a huge <clears throat> Batman fan, so I would definitely get Batman. Where, fuck, I got a lot of skin. Um, <laughs> you know, I could probably put all the rogues gallery on me as well, but I think, uh, like Jason, uh, the guy I spend my life standing next to in movies and in real life, he has put tattoos on his calves that look kind of badass. He put, like, the Justice League symbols on his calves back in the day. So, I, you know, I got a, a, a fairly large calf. I think that has to do with the fact that the rest of me is big. And so when I walk, I, my, that's the only part of my body that's developed. I walk the dogs all the time. My wife makes fun of me. She's like, fucking gun show. Because <laughs> my calves, like, she took a picture of them once. And I, I, I look ripped, like, when I'm walking up the hill. And I was like, that's weird, because the rest of me is real flabby. But I realized, like, I walk on these fuckers all the time, and these fuckers got to hold up, like, a thousand pounds. So they've gotten <laughs> real developed. So I imagine I could put Batman and a muscular-looking Batman on one of my fucking calves. That'd be kind of cool. And plus, they'd be exposed all the time, right? Because right. I'm always wearing jorts. 
So, but at the same time, then I would be like, well, fuck DC. They don't need any promotion with that character. Put your fucking self on your own calves. So I'd probably <laughs> default to Silent Bob on my calf instead. <laughs> but Silent Bob dressed like Batman. Best of both worlds. <laughs> you get to pick a prize, man. Well done. All right, where are we going next, JC? Two prizes left. Well, really one. A pair of socks. <laughs> What, there's just one hey. sock in a bag? Mm-hmm. No, Let's I mean, my, but, you know, yeah, I guess there's two, but then there's, yeah. We're down to the socks, man. Do you have a sock-worthy <laughs> question? I, I don't, I'm sorry. I, my voice is terrible. I'm so sorry. Uh, Jake from Chicago, how's it going? Give it up hey. for him. He's how's from Chicago, hey. man. Uh, so we're getting to that time at the end of the year when people are putting out their top ten list and critics groups are voting for best of the year and we're sort of starting to hear oh, the shit, same you deserve better than again. socks. I like where this no, is going, man. <laughs> so I'm just sort of curious, like, what is the movie that's not getting a lot of attention from 2017 that you wish were getting maybe more accolades at this time this year? That's awesome. I want that. Really? Yes. <laughs> All right, he gets the Buffy statue. Give so it up much for the socks. Great question. Yeah, we... Um, what do I think is not getting attention? Brigsby Bear. It was my, one of my favorite fucking movies of the year. If you love movies about creativity and fucking art, if you like to laugh, you like to feel the movie at all the feels, I've watched it now three times uh, at home. Wonderful movie about uh, the joy of creation and the therapy of, of art. And, and, and just, uh, you know, it, 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 it incredibly well acted. I was kind of like a little heartbroken. I don't know why, I don't, like as if these institutions matter, but I was really bummed that the Indie Spirit Awards <coughs> didn't fucking recognize that flick. I was like, Jesus Christ, it's a low budget movie and it's about the joy of fucking making movies. So I feel like that was overlooked in a, in a big bad way. You guys? Uh, well, we're gonna do a top 10 show at, before the end of the year, so I'll, I'll give away one of the things I was going to put on the list. Uh, Colossal. Oh, I fucking love that movie. <laughs> that movie. So good. The Anne Hache movie? Yeah. Yes. Anne Hache. I mean, Anne Hathaway. I mean, my I bad. would love Anne Hache. <laughs> <laughs> I went back to the 90s for a second. Yeah, the yeah, Anne Hathaway movie. Yeah, Not Anne Hathaway. Movie. Yeah. Uh, so fucking Jason good. Sudeikis. It's this really, really, if you haven't seen it, it's a super fucking smart, crazy story about kaiju and apparently this woman who can control one of the kaiju and how that affects and talks about trauma and PTSD and responsibility and all that stuff in a movie about giant kaiju. Um, if you haven't seen it, you should see it because it's beautiful. Wholly original. It's a movie that like when it's done, you're like, I've never seen that before. Yeah. And, and it holds together too because there's some movies like you could be like, I've never seen that before and I never will again. But yeah. this one, you'll want to watch again. It's pretty smart. And it takes, it does this thing <clears throat> where it takes turns every like 10, 15 minutes that you could not have possibly <laughs> foreseen yeah. by the previous 10 or 15 minutes. That was a joyous journey. I agree. That's a great pick. What about you, Grant? Me? I've not barely seen anything. Honestly, the, this year I've just been working. And I would come home from those, those writer's room things because I've never done them before. And be really sleepy, and I couldn't, I couldn't handle. <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't handle the routine, and the work was fine. But getting up in the morning and coming back at the same time every night, and cooking the same dinner, and I'd sit in front of a movie and always fall asleep. Right. But the only two movies, honestly, that kept me awake this year. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, well, would get out and a cure for wellness. Mm. I saw a cure for wellness. Yeah, that I, I loved. I love that kid. DeHaan, who was, who was in he Valerian. was also in Valerian. He, he wasn't great in Valerian, but everything else he's been really brilliant in. And, and, and that wow, you really gave it and then took it right away from him. No, like, I, mean, I love like, that yeah. kid. He fucked Valerian, <laughs> but I love him. He, no, he, 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 he walked his way through that movie. But, you know, and, and everything else I've seen him, he's been great. Yeah. But that movie where he just come on and like every other kid in movies is super ripped and jacked up. he come on and he was just like hanging out the top of his pants. He was like a complete physical wreck <laughs> through the entire movie. And I, I, I thought it looked beautiful. If it stopped like at the end of Act 2, it would have been one of the greatest horror movies ever. But then it, was, it goes to hell. Um, Gore Verbinski. Yeah, Gore Verbinski. Gore Verbinski. yeah, yeah. And it was all these beautiful grotesques. So th- those were the ones for me. I mean, I don't, I don't have any really uh, obscure picks, but those were the ones that actually kept me awake. Kept you and get out, get out as well, which I was just like, wow, this is great. This is a really good movie. Get out. A movie, yeah. a, a little indie movie needs help. Nobody yeah. ever heard of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, oh, all right. That answers them. Yeah. Thank, well done. Give it up for him. Great question. Yeah. Whoa. <clears throat> Two more pair of socks remain, ladies and gentlemen. That means two questions, JC. Find us a victim, if you will. Hey, how are you? Hey, how's it going? So good. Uh, it's also my birthday, too. I didn't know that. Yeah. Hey. Happy birthday. It's your birthday as well? Yeah. Happy birthday, man. What's your name? Uh, Nick. 
Happy Let's birthday, see if you can Nick. earn some socks, Nick. <laughs> What's your star sign, Nick? Is it, what, uh, my, well, my question is, is that uh, with the CW... What's your star sign? Yeah, what is your What's astrology sign? sign? Uh, Sagittarius. Oh, I really thought so, yeah. Just check. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with the... Uh, with the CW making you know such great shows like the cross with the crossover Supergirl everything like that, what yeah. character do you guys would you guys pick to get either its own show or to also add into this great you know to be added onto these shows or anything like that? These really obscure characters. I say it over and over again. I, they could do them in movies. They could definitely do them on the CW. But I love the character of the Question. Woo! I wish they could add. Yeah. <laughs> faceless, a faceless vigilante. It could be Vic Sage. It could be Renee Montoya. I don't give a fuck. But the idea of somebody who their mask is 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 featureless. That that's terrifying to me. I think that could blend well in that world. Uh, you folks. Uh, I would pick Virgil Hawkins, Static. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Um, <laughs> I mean, they're doing Black Lightning. Um, well, and, and I have some, I have a couple friends on that show, so I will not say anything bad about it. I've heard actually good things about it, um, but I think, I think, yeah. High something. praise. Put I've that been, on a. Poster. I've heard good things. <laughs> I won't say bad things about it. And I know people I have who a, work there. I know a guy. Um, but I think, I think Static. There, there's something specific about you know, like he's, he was supposed to be the Spider-Man. He was Dwayne McDuffie's Spider-Man. Mm. And the idea of being able to play with sort of a teenager in school and high school who's discovering powers and navigating friendship and all that shit, dealing also in, in the sort of African-American experience leveled on top of all that stuff. There's a lot of juice to be squozen from, uh, from static that has never been squozen. So, yeah. <laughs> What about you, sir? I know you probably don't de delve deep on the CW shows. I've checked some of them out. I mean, what I'd love to see, honestly, is the, the version of the, the Guardian that I did, Manhattan Guardian. And it's just because it was always a good setup, I thought, for a, a TV show. Like he's this guy, you know, post-traumatic cop, is hired by a, a newspaper that's created by the people for the people to be the superhero masthead. So he starts just investigating crime. So he's a superhero reporter. And I, I just thought it'd be great. You'd do great procedurals with that kind of character, Jack Kirby-style stories, like we had the Subway Pirates and all that stuff. So he, I think, would be really good. Wow. Super grounded kind of thing. And it's, you know, what it's a like, great deep cuts pull, man. Mm. Fucking, I want to give you a pair of socks. Hold <laughs> on, <man. laughs> um, right on, great question. Yeah, I give need them. I've been wearing the same ones for the last week. Or so I, I, could, I could use some socks. <laughs> <I don't laughs> <know. pair> <laughs> socks. Um, all right, we got one more pair of socks, JC. Where are we going to go? Uh, that's right. Let's All get the way around the to the other side of the room, the dark corner. Hey, of the room. how's it going, gentlemen? Hey, How are you? these could be warming your feet any minute now. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Um, or anything else you want to put socks on. <laughs> <laughs> the socks don't care. Uh, I just want to say, uh, Joe the Barbarian is one of my uh, favorite oh, thank graphic you, novels. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I like that one. As far as uh, revisiting that universe, is there anything you, a possible way that you could do that? And in regards to revisiting, do you think the old school image comics, do you think there's any characters that you can pull out of there and do something with now? I don't know. I mean, most of the stuff I'm doing now would, would probably be new creator stuff. You know, and Joe, the one, the one thing about Joe is that I always had like three extra pages in that book that I'd never got a chance to put in. And I would love to just do them for some edition because it drives me nuts every time I read the book that I had this one scene <laughs> that isn't there. But, but no, I, I, there's no plans to revisit. You know, again, it's something I'd like to turn into, like a show or into a, a, you know, a film or something. But as for the image guys, I kind of did the ones that I liked, you know, when I did the Wildstorm stuff, which lasted for like two months. <laughs> it was The Authority and, and Wildcats. And I kind of touched on the characters that I liked it. Because I was never, I'm never a huge fan of Image. I was a, a kind of artistic, poetic snob at that point, doing Vertigo comics. You, know? you get your socks? Yeah. yeah well right. done. Give him an applause. That's a great question. Um, before we get out of here, a, a word of thanks to Mr. Morrison, not just for coming out and hanging out with him, but uh, hanging out with us tonight. But more importantly, uh, and I've said it before on the show, like. Before I went and did whatever I tried to do, before I made Clerks and then and started my creative journey, uh, I was I fed myself uh, on a bountiful meal of, of things in pop culture that fueled me for like literally the last uh, 20 years. And, I, and, and one of them, or a lot of it, had to do with Grant's work. And I met somebody last week who said something very nice to me. They were like, thank you for a happy childhood. <laughs> and I thought that was really sweet, and I thanked that. I said, hey, man, thank you for getting me out of that fucking convenience store. Like, so it's mutually beneficial. But not only do I want to thank you for a happy childhood, 
but a continued happy adulthood. Like, it's not even like your best shit's behind you. You keep creating better shit fucking all the time. <laughs> Just like the way you were talking about those Marvel movies. They yeah. learn how to refine each time, don't yeah. they? You, with everything you do, you learn how to refine and get closer to the core of who you are. I've always loved you as a storyteller with some of my favorite characters, but you're also like one of my favorite storytellers in real life. Uh, oh. Like just talking, so thank you. Thanks very much, on. Kevin. Thanks for having me on, guys. Of course, this is awesome. awesome. Do you guys have a good time this evening, ladies. Hey, thanks for coming along. Thank you for hanging out with us here at the Scum and Villainy uh, Cantina in Hollywood. Uh, we this is episode 199. 199. Oh. And episode 200 happens Thursday at mm. the Chinese Theater, where we're doing an outdoor show on the uh, forecourt. On the court there, of is, is sitting right on the handprints uh, to benefit the Starlight Children's Foundation. Children's Foundation with the folks that line up. What are the folks that line up? Lining up is liningup.com. Liningup.net. I knew it was in the name somewhere. So you can come out and see us. I think they, all the seats are spoken for, but I think there, there might some be some standing, standing room. room and stuff like that. So that's going to be uh, episode uh, 200. And then when do we come back here? The 19th. I so believe. right before Christmas, we'll yeah. have one show. And we'll do our top tens. Yes. Ooh, that's yeah. the place to do it. Yeah. Um, and I look forward to it. I love doing this show, man. I love being in this space. Give it up for JC in the bar. Woo! Um, we got a great audience. A lot of fa faces or returns. I was saying to Mark before, I was like, we got some norms and some Cliff Clavens out there. Like people <laughs> who are here every time we do the show and fresh faces all the time. And people uh, who've braved fucking wildfires in the deep valley to yeah, come out. Yeah. <laughs> Our heart Thank goes you. out to the folks in Ventura and the surrounding areas who've seen a lot of things just get burned up recently and whatnot. Uh, hopefully, they're, hopefully they're safe and their loved ones are safe. A lot of damage. This is one of the yeah. bad things about living out here is it's so dry. That tweet earlier today. Oh, is that you? Right on. The dude tweeted about maybe not being able to come, and I was like, don't worry about that. You got a lifetime pass forever, but you made it. Yeah. Well, I take that fucking pass back then. <laughs> <laughs> How was it out there? What'd you do? Uh, hold on. Let JC will get you a, a microphone so we're not speaking into a vacuum. Or come on up here. You can just speak into that's good. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that you made it. Oh, yeah, thanks. I was watching my YouTube videos last night, and I didn't know nothing was going on, and I came out and I saw. I could see the fire on the hill, uh -huh. and uh, my parents have lived in that house for 22 years, so um, you know, it was like panic, so I packed up a bunch of shit, went up to Chumash, and uh, played my free slot play up there, whatever, that didn't last long, no luck there. <laughs> and uh, I was at a, in the store, and you know, I wanted to tweet about the fires, and then I got your tweet, and I literally was like walking out to my car, and I just lost it. I just fucking started weeping in my car, you know, and then, and then all the likes and the comments and stuff, I ended up back in Ventura uh, at Walmart, weeping again, several hours later, and I was like, I'm fucking coming, man, I'm not letting some goddamn wildfire, like, keep me away, because I knew my parents were safe, <laughs> stuff like that, I checked on them, when I came yeah, back, fuck my stayed. parents, I'm <laughs> going to the bar, <laughs> no, they fire. stayed, they were like, they, you know, they stayed, they were, uh, the night and stuff, and as I was driving out of town last night, I was like, oh my God, I'm watching like, like uh, hills right above where I work, you know, burning. And I'm like, it's scary. Oh my God. It, like, yeah. we get to see it from a distance here, and it's still frightening. Yeah. I can't imagine what it's like when you get close. We've seen harrowing pictures from and I'm just LA like Times of cars escaping flames. Right. And shit. I'm just like everybody else, you know, I've seen the disasters, but I've never been in the middle of one. And it's just like, it kind of puts some things in, you know, check or whatever. Like, what, you know. Priorities, right? You know? It does. It makes yeah, you think like, whether or not you want to come. Yeah, to that Star was Wars well. Bar. I was like, I've been waiting for this. Like, I saw you in 2001 for Jay and Bob uh, Strike Back. I went to the Comic Con for the first and only time Get because here, it got really? too. Mo it's too crazy now. Like, I feel like it's kind of, <laughs> yeah, it's very hectic. You know, to try to get into Hall H would be impossible. But I think I, that's where you were. I wait. I waited in line for hours then too. But I had a blast, and then I was. Like when you guys started doing this, I was like, no shit. You know, like an it's intimate like way setting easier to like find this? us yeah. here, man. Yeah. In yeah, a way so. smaller room. You could throw a tissue at us and yeah. hurt us. Like we're so just I was waiting please for payday. <laughs> please I was, don't. I don't want to know what's in the tissue. You guys sell out so fast. I like was waiting for payday and I, stung, I decided to check and I saw there was a show tonight. I was like, oh shit, I need to borrow some money. Because like I can't <laughs> miss out. You know, I'm going to miss every show if I wait till my check comes. You know, so, um, 
I did that, and here I am. And then last night, I was like, oh, yeah, just my fucking luck, right? The world's going to start burning because when I'm about to go see, you know, go have fun. Because I haven't done, you know, I haven't gone out a lot since my, I had my son out, seven years ago. And, um, this is like out. the best country song. Was it that? really is. <laughs> yeah. And mom and dad are safe. Yeah, mom and dad are cool. And uh, my brother is also uh, with them. We were both staying there, uh, helping them sell their house. So that's nice too, huh? Their house burns down right before they're right about before to sell, they it. sell it. Yeah, yeah, they're in the middle of a deal right now. And, you know, also a couple of weeks before <laughs> Christmas. People buying are like, hold one yeah. second, please. <laughs> well, now yeah. they can charge like 100000 more because it's the only house left. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, um, but anyways, thank you for that, you know, and of course, thank everything you. else, like I found you in a video store when Dogma was released, thank and on a day off, I went home, I was like, oh yeah, I remember seeing a trailer for this during Christmas, I came back here, and I went back to Oregon where I was living, and I was like, immediately, like, I was like, this guy, like, he gets it, you know, like, I don't know, it's just, there was something about it, I was like. I, I lost it a long time well, ago, but back then, I really got come it. Come you know? on. You're too humble, man. You created the shared universe. You pioneered it in the, in the film. No. In God, film, no. Man, I swear I to God. I just stole that from comic did, books. I mean, you were saying John Hughes and stuff like that, but that. You know, I don't think Hughes ever had characters cross over like that. You know, your your adventures with I, Jane I pointed Bob. out today online that John Hughes they didn't cross over, but all the Hughes movies, most of them, Reference. took place in Shermer, yeah. Illinois, or reference yeah. Shermer, Illinois. Yeah. That's where I got the idea. I was like, holy fuck! I remember seeing Weird Science, and I was like, oh, yeah. holy fuck! They said Shermer, Illinois, and that's where they served detention in the Breakfast Club. And of course, comic books. Like everyone shared the universe in comic books, so I brought it over from there. And also, a little unsung uh, uh, cameo in Coming to America when they cut to Don Amici and Ralph Bellamy. Like John Landis did it years ago, and just to see they're walking through the park and they give money to two bums, and all of a sudden it's the two guys that Eddie Murphy beat in Trading Places. <laughs> and I remember being in the theater and being like, holy fuck, it's kind of a sequel. Like, you know. So I remember when I wanted to, when I was making my flicks, I was like, oh, let's tie them together, because that was fun when I saw that. So I got to give credit for those that went before me. Well, I have one more thing, though, too. I showed my son Dogma, he's like seven, you know what? You showed a seven-year-old Dogma? <laughs> yeah, okay, security clicks. <laughs> Deadpool even makes more sense than Dogma, though, to be fair. What did, what did he make of Dogma? He's like, I like the poop monster. The angel movie? That's what my mother calls it as well. And not because the angel's in it. She's like, my angel made it. Aww. <laughs> she likes me a lot. Smart. Don't let him see the end. Yeah, it's kind of frightening. Um, right on. Well, while you made it through the rain, or the fire in this case, put it together for him, ladies and gentlemen. Um, all right, uh, and I guess that's all the show uh, we got for you. Thanks for being here with us, uh, come hell or high water. Uh, and uh, thanks again to Grant Morrison for being our guest. Thanks for coming along, guys. Mr. Mark Bernardin for always providing the intelligence to the show. Give it up for Mark, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, pshaw. And that is Batman on Bad Fit Batman for this week. I'm Kevin Smith. I'm Mark Bernardin. And who are you? Uh, I'm Whitney Houston. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll always love you, baby. <laughs> Tune in next time. Same fat time. Same fat channel. Smodcast.com or YouTube.com slash Kevin Smith. Good night, everybody. Peace. Good night.